You ready? Okay. Anyway, I went back down to where she had x-rays on file at Texas Chiropractic College down in Houston. And I went down and met her two chiropractors that, she, that had taken the x-rays and had everything on file there on her case, x-rays before showing the anatomical short arm and leg, the, t the tremendous, as I recall it, going back to the tremendous rotation she had of the lumbar spine, okay? And I went down and talked to them, and they showed the x-rays after her. Her whole body was perfectly symmetrical, all on file. I said to them, I said, um, I said, you've been taking care of Ann all these years? Oh, yes. She has done beautifully. I said, what do you think about what happened? Oh, this is the most wonderful thing that's ever happened on the planet. I said, wonderful. Now, what do you folks plan on doing about it? I'm willing to help you out and get you folks fully trained so that you can be a benefit to people. And they said, John, we had a meeting on this. We can't afford to spend the time working the amount of time that you've done with Ann. We have people coming in, and five minutes later, they have to go out again. We do our adjustments. We get them. We have a, a streamlined program. And we have set a goal for ourselves that if we don't make a million dollars each a year, we're not good chiropractors. I said, well, how about the body electronics? Well, we don't have time to do that because we're... We're, if we're going to be good chiropractors, we have to make a million dollars a year, and we did some projection, and we can't, uh, we have no time for the body electronics work. They said, we, we support what you're doing, but we don't have the time for that because we're, frankly, we're into money. And this is where the practitioners are in the States. Most of them have coursework showing how they, if they're not making a quarter of a million dollars a year, free and clear after all their expenses, they're not a good chiropractor. And this is the coursework that has been given to chiropractors. The medical doctors are in the same situation. Money is their god, for the most part. The few medical doctors that, where money is not their god and they're using alternative approaches, they're being called on and being, I'm not going to use the word deregulated, but de being deregistered for, for doing alternative type therapies. So the medical doctors are between a rock and a hard place. You follow me? Other therapies are, are being ruled out by the medical profession that has such power in the various state uh, uh, legislatures that, um, like, for example, Illinois, with the stroke of the pen, 700 uh, nature, uh, not nature pass, but napper pass, that is a precursor to chiropractic, they're all out of work because it's now illegal to do that in the state of Illinois. And you have the same thing going on all over the country where you have a tremendous lobbying on the part of the medical profession to do away with anything natural. Now, the Australian Medical Society is doing the same thing because a, a number of your medical doctors here are between a rock and a hard place because if they're found using any type of alternative therapy, they're called in and threatened. Same thing with New Zealand. Now, this is a, this is a sad situation. And the people are going to have to demand freedom of choice in health care and demand it and demand it vigorously and vociferously like your wood chip people are, are doing on the environmental level and de demand that they have the same rights. Now, the osteopathic profession in the states was all swallowed up by the medical doctors. They're trying to do the same thing with the chiropractors now by putting the chiropractors on the same level as a medical doctor as long as you do the proper things will give you the right to practice and you make big money, but you can't use alternative therapy. And you have to use only a certain brand of, of uh, approved drugs and medication. And the nature paths are out on a limb pretty much because they're, they're trying to d destroy them state by state where the nature paths have no right to practice. It's a felony to be an herbalist in the state of Tennessee. It's a felony to be a, an herbalist or to even call yourself a naturopathic doctor. That's how much control the medical profession has. Now, I understand there's quite a few chiropractors here. You're under the gun. If you, quite a few naturopaths here. You're under the gun. You may not know it yet, but the time will come when you're not going to be able to do anything legally and let, because it'll be ruled by a huge corporate medical 
Institute. Now you might think, well, that's not going to happen here. Well, that's what the Americans said. Doug, you might want to add some light to that. Well, the thing about it is, is that what you have underneath all of this is you have that you have the lust for money, and you have certain vested interests. You got the pharmaceutical companies mainly, but you also got all the the high tech companies that make all the you know the fancy uh, medical type equipment, you know, you know the MRI equipment and all the rest, and. These, these uh, institutions have a tremendous vested interest in, keep in, in maintaining the status quo. Uh, take, a, take cancer as an example. To me, and I'm a numbers person, mind you, to me the single most uh, important statistic about cancer is a very simple one. There's more people making a living off it than there are dying from it. You know, so w what incentive is there really to change the status quo? I mean, what, is there to, what incentive is there for a lot of these foundations and, and large, huge institutions to actually enact things that are low cost and, and actually work in, 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 in healing people? They'd all be out of jobs, you know? The profits would go down, the shareholders would be upset. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, shall we say, monetary interests that are very uh, uh, deeply entrenched and very much uh, committed to maintaining the status quo at all costs. And so when something new and alternative comes along, the first effort will generally be to eradicate it, just completely snuff it out. If that doesn't work, like for example in the United States with the chiropractors, they tried to wipe them out for many years and they weren't able to wipe them out. So now they're going the other way and instead of wiping them out, they're trying to just absorb them and basically convert them into medical doctors. And they're starting to offer new degrees called DCMs, Doctor of Chiropractic Medicine where chiropractors are going to start being able to prescribe drugs and you know pretty soon the you know pretty soon there won't be a dime's worth of difference between a chiropractor and the and the you know the orthodox medical doctors it's the same thing in the united states that they did to the osteopathic profession in the united states i can assure you there's you know in all but a very few rare cases there's not a dime's worth of difference between a do and an md the the training and the residency and all the rest are the, are the exact same and your average, you know, osteopath is not doing any any actual osteopathy anymore. They're not even doing any adjustments. They're doing drugs and they're doing they're doing surgery. And that's the way things have gone in the states. And that's kind of the way the chiropractors are being, you know, driven at this point. You can't like I live in in Pennsylvania, which is a state where there's still a you know if you go down down to the local hospital, probably 30 or 40 percent of the doctors there are DOs instead of MDs. So there's a lot of osteopaths around, but, they don't but do adjustments. you can't find an osteopath. I've yet to find a single osteopath around that, that actually does adjustments as a regular part of their practice. I mean, they've had the training, but once they get out there, they don't do it because their, their MD friends laugh at them if they suggest an adjustment. And the medical policy for the hospital say you can't. Yeah. So, so basically, the, you know, if you, can't, if you can't wipe them out, you just you just you just swallow them up and and convert them you know and the easiest way to do that of course is through the money you know the easiest way to co-opt the you know whether it's the osteopaths or the chiropractors or whatever is through the lure of, of big bucks you know million dollars a year you know and so that's what you know that's the way things have gone in the states you won't you know you're you won't find uh, you won't find too many of the of even in the chiropractic profession you won't find too many in the states that really are using anything alternative or anything natural. It's just pretty much just, you know, you know, rack them in, crack them up, and send the building insurance company. I mean, it's just, you know, one after the other, you know, 250 patients a day, you know, just bing, bang, boom, next, and, you know, two, three minutes with a patient, and that's the, that's the way that they go because that's how they can make the money, you know? $100 for each patient. Yeah. yeah. That's the way it is. Okay, folks. We've got dinner ready for us. Now, let's take a break now. It's about 1 o'clock. Let's take about, uh, let's be back here about 2 o'clock. Now, give us an hour for, uh, for a good period of time. Okay? Stretch your let a wonderful, wonderful lunch. Yay. Yay. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Mark. I think that was marvelous. This afternoon, we're going to get directly into what do we need to do with the physical body. We're going to point the way to material that is already in print that you'll have to take a little time and do a little study. 
Anita's going to take care of this end of it, and this is where she she shines in her working with the many people over the number of years on helping them with nutritional programs. And uh, she's going to go over basic material, and uh, Doug and I'll chime in where we feel there might be something that we need to uh, go into more detail on. But here's the problem that all of you are going to be confronted with. Like, for example, up in at um, Geneseo Convention Center, when, where we had our four-week-long uh, seminar here recently, if a person wasn't getting results, we had to go back to basics and find out what was not happening. And perhaps they might not be getting enough B-complex, which was true in some cases. In some cases, they weren't getting enough protein, and they were protein deficient, which kept them from functioning properly. Uh, they may be mineral deficient, where they weren't getting enough minerals, and the minerals are being utilized too rapidly as their body went through changes. And whatever the problem was, uh, we had to find out where, where were we missing the boat, where we need to polish up on little individual differences that people needed this or little that. And um, I'm, I'm going to ask Anita to just start from scratch on the basic things that we need to go through for our bodies to bring about the healing crisis and regeneration. And so, Anita, why don't you just start right in? Okay. And uh, Doug and I will tap you on the nose or something. Okay, whenever you want to. Can you bring it back that way a little more? Hmm? Bring it. Okay. No, that's good. One up. You're all right. That's perfect. Okay. Uh, I know probably a lot of you are on the nutritional program already from the tapes, uh, and so it might be a little boring for you, but we do have to cover this for the people who are not uh, aware of the program yet. And for the people that are on the program, you could practice your lovingly and willingly enduring all things <laughs> during this time. Uh, okay. We need some basic things in the body. They are enzymes, minerals, vitamins, amino acids, essential fatty acids, and oxygen. <coughs> These are the basics that we start with on the supplementation. Now, to start with the enzymes, we suggest a fresh and raw diet. This is because the enzymes, if you cook your food, the enzymes are destroyed at 116 degrees Fahrenheit or 46 degrees centigrade. So we suggest a fresh and raw diet to get the enzymes from the raw food. Now, raw food will have in it enough enzymes to digest the food that you are eating, but it will not have enough enzymes to correct long-standing enzyme deficiency. So bottom the line. bottom line, so we have to take the enzymes. I don't think there's one person in here that doesn't have some enzyme deficiency. Over the hundreds and hundreds of eyes that I've looked at, uh, we always have the indication in the eye of the enzyme deficiency. I haven't seen one person ever not to have it. I don't know if Doug or John has. So, so enzymes, okay. Uh, Okay, well, here in Australia, what are we using? Why don't you hit the basic principles? Okay, well, enzymes, uh, the, we're using the Nest brand in New Zealand, and... Uh, what sort of enzymes is that? Oh, okay. Oh, okay, I'm going to go through that. All right, first of all, we use amylase to digest carbohydrate, protease to digest protein, lipase 
to digest fat. And sometimes we just use a basic food enzyme, which combines all of them, just for a basic enzyme, like for children or for people that don't have a real serious, serious problem. Okay. Uh, now, the prote proteolytic enzyme we have found in people that have the green pawpaw available, we have found that the green pawpaw drink we make to increase the proteolytic enzymes in the body. What we do is we make it into a smoothie. We take the skin, the sap, and the seeds of the green pawpaw, put it in a blender with some other fruit, and some fruit juice. You could put coconut cream in, uh, coconut juice, uh, fruit juice. You could put water. Uh, just make it into a really nice, delicious smoothie with mostly fruit. I wouldn't put milk in it. Some people put milk in their smoothies. But the, uh, the fruit, the <laughs> coconut cream, coconut juice uh, works really good for that. And this gives you a high percentage of proteolytic enzymes. Now, the proteolytic enzymes will help us to eat up the cancers and tumors in the body. Because when you're eating a large percentage of cooked food, what happens is you wear out the pancreas. And the pancreas then has to borrow enzymes from other part of the body to digest the food that you're eating. And after a while, the pancreas just gets worn out. And when cancerous conditions start within the body, there's no spare enzymes there to digest these abnormal tissues. So the uh, green pawpaw drink is excellent for people with things like tumor, cancers, things like that. Yes? Uh, not the same enzyme, but it does work on cancerous conditions. They have discovered in Indiana at uh, Purdue University in Lafayette, Indiana, that you have, according to the findings, you have a substance in the papaya leaf, the stems in the leaf of the pawpaw or papaya, where there's a material which is isolated, or shall we say concentrated, by boiling it down for about two to three hours of boiling of, the, of a number of leaves that you chop up, put it into a big uh, container, and then boil it down to a brine. And that um, the material is about one million times more powerful than any other anti-cancer agent anywhere in the world. And so we put our people on the boiled down, simmered down, which is near boiling, the papaya leaf. The proteolytic enzymes are destroyed by the boiling, but there's another ingredient, which I don't have the name of yet, uh, which is the anti-cancer agent. This is an old aboriginal recipe, okay? We found it very effective in destroying cancers in the body. But in the meantime, that does not correct the proteolytic enzyme level in the body and doesn't cure the pancreatic problems. So when the pancreas is no longer working and the body is suffering from severe enzyme deficiencies, which most people are because of the processed food diet that they have been eating for so long, um, the body does require the proteolytic enzymes from the uncooked mature green papaya uh, that's when you still have the white sap in the skin and in the stems, and that's what you want to use. Now, you just cannot get a mature green one uh, because some of them are yellow. You know, they're yellow while they're still green, and they're full of your papain. Uh, but you're going to have to work it out as to the variety of, of the papaya that you're using as to when you no longer have the uh, papain, which is your proteolytic enzyme, running smoothly in, in the papaya. But that is absolutely a requirement to boost the immune system. I like to point out when I was in Maui, Hawaii, there was a Dr. Leighton King there. Dr. King uh, spent many years in doing research on, on proteolytic enzymes. And uh, one of his greatest uh, studies is that when you increase the proteolytic enzyme intake orally, 
you, in, you increase the immune system tremendously. Now, um, if you don't mind me taking a moment here. Go ahead. I was going to talk about that. Go ahead. What are you going to talk about? Well, I was just going to talk about the immune system, but you go ahead. Okay. Uh, when I was in Rorotonga, and I spent a bit of time very quietly meditating in my office, all of a sudden, you've all done your meditation, you all get your little golden light, sometimes white light coming in, and all of a sudden I got the golden light coming in through the meditation just beautifully, and all of a sudden this beautiful papaya tree comes right in to the middle of that golden light. It's just a beautiful papaya tree. And so in my meditation, I was looking at this papaya tree sitting there in this beautiful golden light, and suddenly this voice speaks out and says, Live where the, the papaya thrives for your physical salvation in years to come. And I've given that a lot of thought because there's nothing you can find better to increase the immune system in the body than the mature green papaya. So one of the things to do is to get the type of papaya that has the highest amount of papain content and start growing it and making sure that the thing has a place where you can uh, sustain it properly, uh, even in drought conditions. Because as the immune system continues to increase on the planet with the lack of oxygen that I'm sure you're all aware of, what I say? Increase. As the what? You said that the immune system continues to increase. As the immune system problems continue to increase. Oh, okay then you're going to have, you're going to realize that there's a lack of oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere uh, where it's continually decreasing at the present time, uh, which is causing tremendous havoc to the human bodies with the increase of bacterial infections and uh, uh, parasite infections. Um, your the number of immune deficiency problems all due to a lack of oxygen. And uh, where the immune system problems arise, the papaya will be one of the best medicines that we can take on a regular basis to keep the immune system functioning at top level. So I just want to mention that. This is uh, uh, a high priority item. Uh, there's one contraindication for the green papa drink. And that is for pregnant women. Uh, the seeds act as a natural abortive. So if you are intending to become pregnant or uh, you are pregnant, I would abstain from having the green pawpaw drink <laughs> until... Pardon me? Uh, probably leave it again. She said, could we leave the seeds out? No. No, I would... The, uh, because of the... Plan. For pregnancy. Uh, if you leave the seeds out and you're still taking the proteolytic enzyme, you're still going to, the proteolytic enzyme eats up the abnormal tissue, which is the placenta tissue. The, pl the cancerous tissue, which is a placenta-like tissue throughout the body, is eaten up by the proteolytic enzymes. Uh, you can leave the seeds out, but you're still taking the, uh, the, the papain into the body, and that will cause the um, breaking down of your placenta tissue and will cause these involuntary uh, abortions. Yes, okay. Yes, in the back there. The action is different. The action is different, yes. Okay, uh, now someone on the break asked me about cataracts and we've had a number of people with cataracts and we've had very good success with it and uh, what we're using for that is the uh, amylase enzyme with the niacin the niacin is a vitamin b3 which opens the capillaries going into the eye and uh, the amylase enzyme goes in there and dissolves off that crystallization on the lens so the com combination of the amylase with the niacin is very important with cataracts. Now, of course, we use full program. When I, when I just say amylase and niacin, I'm not just saying use that if you have a cataract. 
but those two you should definitely have in the program. Uh, full program is what I mentioned first, all, all the things that I said that were essential to get the regeneration. Okay, also, uh, yes? I was wondering, what, what's the difference with the enzyme in the national enzyme? Mm -hmm. What's the difference between the spoon enzyme and the lymphatic enzyme? I know they have a different amount of protease, lipase, and amylase, but I'm just wondering, <coughs> what, why are they in a different uh, combination of size? What, what's the difference? Uh, Fifteen years ago, I'm the one responsible for that, okay? And so I know a little bit about that. At that time, they had only the food enzymes, which would, uh, the company put out just the food enzymes, which was kind of an equal balance of amylase, protease, and lipase, with some cellulase with it. And it was a good program for digestion. But what I was studying and working on back in the early 1980s was trying to figure out what do we do for what we call the, uh, not the sodium ring, but that which is a mucoprotein ring around the eye, uh, which is oftentimes due to a, uh, a heavy lymphatic congestion buildup that for those of you who are iridologists, you find that in zone six. And so I started looking very carefully at what can we do with that mucoprotein buildup. If you go into the medical books very carefully, and one of the best authorities on this is Arthur Guyton's work on medical physiology, and Dr. Guyton says very clearly in there that this is indestructible, and once you have a mucoprotein problem, or what we call a trapped plasma protein problem, this is indestructible, and you can't do anything about it, you just have to live with your lymphatic congestion caused by this condition from that time on. And so when somebody tells me that I can't do something, then I, that gets my, uh, gets my interest up. And I figure, okay, now what can we do? What is mucoprotein? Mucoprotein is a combination of undigested prote uh, protease, or pardon me, protein and undigested carbohydrate. Okay, what digests carbohydrate but amylase, and what digests your uh, protein but your proteolytic enzymes, or protease. And so I talked to Dr. Howell and made arrangements for him to design specifically for me a, a highly potent lymphatic, now we didn't call it a lymphatic enzyme at that time. In fact, I didn't put that label on it. I, I used a concentrated protease and concentrated amylase. And Dr. Hal designed that for me years ago, about 15 years ago, and we've been using it effectively ever since. Now, Doug will have a picture of my eye from about 15 years ago. And uh, by the way, that's the only copy in existence. And I had a solid mucoprotein ring all the way around my eye, lymphatic rosary, not just a string of pearls as you go around there, but a, a very heavy, solid ring around there. And uh, this is one of the reasons to try to figure out, what do I do with this doggone thing? I had a, at that time, I had a severe pancreatic disorder. And whatever I ate, I didn't digest. And so this mucoprotein just filled my entire eye from zone six on inward. But I don't have it now. It's gone. What, but what did I do for it? Is I designed this particular thing, not just for me, but other people with the same problems that I had. And so the lymphatic enzyme is a name that was hung on this just a f few short years ago. And the reason that they did that was because the National Enzyme Company wanted to come out with another doctor's formula called NESS that is being utilized throughout the world. And they wanted to use a concentrated enzyme similar to the one that I had agreed that they would not duplicate. And so the, they haven't been able to do that. But in order for them to put out a concentrated proteolytic enzyme, which is on their formulations, but they uh, got Enzymes International to agree to use the word lymphatic enzymes. And so they could use concentrated enzymes, which the Enzymes International was using up until that time. The, you might say, how about the quality of the product? It's identically the same between the NESS and the Enzymes International because they're both made by exactly the same company. Okay? But the, you will find that the formulations will differ slightly. 
but the results will be the same because the quality is the same. Okay? If you took about two tables, not two tablespoons, uh, two, two capsules three times a day, you start out with that to see how it works because it's highly concentrated enzymes. Then gradually increase that to maybe three capsules three times a day. It does not have the lipase in it necessary for, <coughs> excuse me, for fat digestion. But it does have heavy proteolytic and heavy uh, um, amylytic enzymes in it. So I also mentioned on the bottle that um, you have the lymphatic between meals and the food enzymes with sodium. I didn't put that there. <laughs> see? Uh, you can, as far as I'm concerned, when you get those enzymes into your system, okay, they're going to do the job regardless of when you take them. And the important thing is, is to get them down because then they move in through the intestinal area anytime, any, whenever you're eating or not eating. And then they're, they're going to digest what they're going to digest and it uh, uh, doesn't matter when you take them. I would prefer taking them with your meals because most of us would forget them if they were between meals. We're busy. And, uh, but take them with your meals and then let them digest what food they're going to digest. The rest is, are going to go where they have to go. In the meantime, you've made good use of those enzymes and you're helping to correct the long-standing enzyme deficiencies in the body. I don't know what you're saying. Uh, well, my understanding of, norm, of normal humans is that is that we make digestive enzymes out of the pancreas and it helps dissolve protein fats, etc., and the lipase proteins. Here, speak, speak here so everybody can hear you in the back. Come stand up, please, and speak into here so that we get you on tape. Okay. My understanding is that the pancreas yeah. produces enzymes which break down food. My understanding is that the pancreas produces enzymes, lipases, um, proteases, amylases, etc., which break down food into their component very small parts, like tiny bits of sugar or most minute <coughs> fractions of um, protein, etc., because you don't, for instance, absorb whole proteins into your bloodstream because that would be cause allergy reactions. In fact, that is one of the causes why babies get allergies, etc., etc. So we produce digestive enzymes which break food down, but we can't. I wouldn't have thought, absorb whole particles of enzymes which are complex structures through the cell wall of the intestine, holus bolus, because if we did, I would have thought, in my night, and you've studied it more than I, that the enzymes would actually start destroying tissues within our own body, for instance, proteins in the blood. So are there different sorts of enzymes? There are over 100,000 enzyme particles of all shapes and sizes within every cell. And as the enzymes are absorbed in through the villi of the small intestines, which they are, you have now proof, medical proof, where they've done tremendous studies on this, <coughs> that even an undigested protein can now be absorbed in through the walls of the intestine. And this is new findings. Now, for many years, they said that can't be done. Only the digested food can be absorbed in through the wall of the intestine. But now, now they know that the undigested <coughs> food can be absorbed in and actually end up in that form 
in the interstitial spaces between the, the small capillaries and the cells. And the, this is what they call the mucoprotein or the trapped plasma protein. So uh, all of these happen. Now they know that the, since your, shall we say, the trapped plasma protein or the long chains of undigested protein and undigested carbohydrate will end up in the interstitial spaces. They find also now, which is taking a turnaround from what was taught, say, 10 years ago, that even the, the enzyme particles do not, are not absorbed through the wall of the small intestine. Now they know the whole lot are. So they've changed their, they've done a complete turnaround on, on uh, what is done. They call this that, uh, they don't understand it, but they call it a leaky colon. I mean, not leaky colon, a leaky intestine. And uh, leaky gut syndrome is what they're calling it. Pardon? Leaky gut syndrome. Leaky gut syndrome is another name for it. And that they don't know that they just call it that, but they don't know what else to hang on it. But uh, everything that they used to say can't be done is being done today. Okay. Uh, now, the lipase we use in conjunction with the flax oil. Uh, I'll be talking about the flax oil in a couple minutes, but the lipase helps to dissolve the fats and the oil. Uh, we use this because a lot of times a person's liver cannot handle so much oil uh, going through the system, so the lipase helps to break that down. Okay, now, the minerals... I'm not going to go into detail on the minerals because the minerals are responsible for many, many processes within the body. A bottom line is that they combine with the enzymes to form an alkaline detoxifying agent. And they help to pull out a lot of the toxins that are in the body. Uh, it's a more detailed view of the minerals are in that blue book, the patient guide, if you want to read all the things that the minerals do. Um, yes. Another question about minerals. Yes. Uh, we're getting the minerals from North Queensland in the big stack. The uh, min plus. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> from memory, you said, uh, John, that you uh, put a teaspoon per, you want to have about three glasses of minerals a day. And you put a teaspoon of mineral for each glass of water or mineral drink. And then you can whack it in a jug and mix it with water and let it fill overnight. And the minerals will just automatically be mixed up in the water and you get less of a solution set. Is that true? Yes, that's true. Um, there are several different ways of handling this. And this is what many, many different people all over Australia are using on the Min Plus. Let's start out with the bottom line on what has been handled by the, shall we say, the native Australians for many years. And that's taking the Min Plus and dissolving it as much as you can in a bucket of water. Okay? And they let the solid particles settle out, pour off the fluid where they have saturated that with what we call the colloidal material and put that into another container and let that settle out for 24 hours and then pour that out to into a third container and let that settle out for 24 hours. Now, after that third container is settled out, you pour off what's left. I mean, there's very little sediment then. You pour off what's left, and they call that a decanted material. And they take one teaspoon of that a day, and people get well on that. One teaspoon, teaspoon a day of that. And there are people are getting well all over the country by using that one teaspoon a day. That's what Doug does. Uh, Doug takes two liters of that saturated uh, colloidal solution a day, and uh, Doug has just went through a marvelous, marvelous healing crisis that uh, about wasted him away, you know. <laughs> 
but he had a wonderful, wonderful change and uh, a wonderful healing just recently on that. Uh, if I say it's too much, Doug does it double or triple. <laughs> and, it, uh, and he's still surviving, and he's doing quite well surviving. Okay? Now, that's the bottom line of this one teaspoon of this decanted material. The other line is what Doug is experimenting with his own body. Now, the third alternative is I take a teaspoon of the stuff in a glass of water and drink it down, just the way it is, mud and all. And I do that about three times a day, and I've had nothing but good healing crisis from it. And other people have also. There's one problem, and you need to know what that problem is. There's a nickel content, which is all over Australian land. There's no place that you can't find nickel a very small amount, but some people think there's a possibility that if you take the nickel internally, that it could be toxic to the body. Therefore, if it's colloidal, it will be non-toxic to the body. That we know. So therefore, it's best to decant it and be on the safe side. Okay? The other a aspect of it is, if you have a high acid content in the stomach, It'll break the 40 micron material down, which you get on that very on that min plus. Okay, it'll break that down. Supposedly, they use a um, an acid slurry solution for the stuff to put on the cane fields, and that breaks everything down into a colloidal material that the cane industry can utilize instantly, and have them save them millions of dollars you know, from buying petrochemicals. And so the the cane industry. The sugar industry is thriving off this stuff because it gets such wonderful yields. Same thing, other people who use it for their mangoes and for their other uh, fruits and vegetables. Now, the theory is if a high concentration of your acid will break down your 40 microns down to a half a micron size, how about the acid in our stomach? Is, and my question is a legitimate one. Is there enough acid in our stomach to break that down for the 40 micron down to a colloidal? Uh, up till now, I haven't had any problem with the stuff. But there is a possibility, an outside possibility, that the small amount of nickel could become toxic unless it's decanted properly. And I think to be on the safe side, decant it and take it in a colloidal form, drink it down, no problem. I was just going to say on the subject of Min Plus, you know, coming from the states where I've been using the Enzymes International Minerals for like 10 years, and they're absolutely a fantastic, fantastic mineral, but they're very expensive. I mean, even in the states, let alone what you folks would have to pay here to, to ship them here, you don't know how lucky you are to have the Min Plus because with somebody like me that's been doing Enzymes International Minerals for 10 years, I almost never find any other mineral that muscle tests even halfway decent. I mean, when you're already pretty well mineralized, and the Min Plus is the first one I've seen in years that muscle tests well on somebody that's already well mineralized. And considering that it costs you basically nothing, you know, you guys, no, without question, for anybody in Australia, Min Plus is the, is the way to go, because it's basically free. You know, it just takes a little bit of effort, and you can do as much as you want. So I'd say it's the way to go here, De but decanted, I would say. You, you get it from Sam Catalano in Innisfail. I highly recommend that for agricultural purposes. <laughs> now, if you want to use that for other purposes, that is your responsibility. Mm. I, I hope you understand what I'm saying here. Mm. It is not a part of the Therapeutic Goods Act. Now, you can't go out here and sell that as a supplement for humans or animals. It is for agricultural purposes only, and that's what it's designed for, and that's what you get. Now, if, now if you need minerals and you don't want to go out here and eat dirt and you want to eat something for agricultural purposes, that's your business. Little intestinal agriculture. <laughs> But I have found the stuff does change the closed lesions in the eye from a 
Uh, we've had a number of people up in uh, cans. Uh, you examined them, where the closed lesions opened up and, and disappeared in some cases. For those of you who are into iridology, I hope you understand what we call the closed lesion from the Jensen point of view is similar to the lacuna in the German point of view. And those actually, in some people who go through a healing crisis, we've had those closed lesions that they had, which is, shows a genetic weaknesses, literally opening up and going away. And uh, we found that with the Min Plus, and they're, they're on the Min Plus. But there are other people who are on other type of minerals, likewise. One is the minerals from nature's sunshine that you cannot get in Australia, but you can get them in New Zealand. It's called um, um, mineral maintenance. And it's a material which is made out of Mount Morelianite. And you have, I found out the other day that you have Mount Morelianite here in Australia, and you have deposits of it. They're old, ancient kelp bed deposits. And you have that material here. And as far as I'm concerned, that stuff is pure gold for nutritional purposes. Now, I haven't had the time to look into where you can find it. But if you can find that doggone stuff and take the time to mill it, encapsulate it, and get it out to people, you have yourself a wonderful, wonderful business and provide people a tremendous service of getting those minerals out to people because it comes from an ancient kelp bed. And uh, I was introduced this about 30 years ago in, this, in the States, uh, material from Mount Morelonite by Dr. John Christopher. And uh, Dr. John Christopher was the first man that ever read my eyeballs. And it, um, uh, he gave me a whole jug of this dirt. He says, you take a, a spoonful of that every day and you'll be healthy the rest of your life. Well, I didn't take him up on it. <laughs> but the stuff was, that's when I was introduced to it. I didn't know how good it was at that time. Sure. Mineral deficiency. They just have to. They just have to eat something to get that. Yeah. But the minerals are a key. Mount Morelianite. I can I don't know how to spell it. If you get a bottle, if you get a bottle of, who knows how to spell Morelianite? Mount Morelianite. M O N T. M O R. R I double L. You got the same problem I have. <laughs> Say it again, John, if you would, sir. M O N T. M O R. I double L. I N I T E, something like that. Okay, Mount Relonite. Uh, bentonite is just uh, used as an absorbent, so to speak, and is used in conjunction with colon cleansing programs. The problem I have had in my training as a colon therapist, I've had people who use bentonite in various colon cleansing programs, and that when I was working as a colon therapist, I have used to have to get these huge amounts of stuff that set up like concrete inside of their cecums because the people didn't take enough nutrients and fiber and so on with the, Mount, uh, with the uh, bentonite to wash it through their systems. And it was set up in your, um, what we call the fecal lifts, which is the outpouching in the colon wall, and it was sometimes set up in the cecum like cement and caused more problems than they had the person had in the first place. But uh, this, you have to be very careful of the use of bentonite. You have to make sure you wash it on through the body, and then that's a very good uh, absorbent used in small amounts. Yes. Pardon me. I, the rock dust made by. I don't know a thing about that. Now, there's another rock dust made over in the Perth area in Western Australia. I don't know a thing about that. I do know that the rock dust 
that has been utilized by Sam Catalano has a broad range of minerals, more than thousands of other samples that he's worked with. And it's the best that he has found in, in, uh, in, um, uh, in Australia. But there's one other one that they found over in the Perth area that they're using also on a more limited basis for garden purposes. But there again, uh, now did, did I make this clear to you? I'm telling you what people are doing. You cannot sell this because it doesn't fit in what you call your, um, uh, on your Therapeutic Goods Act. It doesn't meet that standard. And so you cannot recommend that for human consumption. But a lot of people have been using it for years for human consumption. That's a historical fact. Pardon me? I would imagine you can give things away, but you certainly cannot uh, recommend it to people if you want some order it yourself from your local, uh, from the local nursery. <coughs> okay. Now, um, I I feel that there, the Therapeutic Goods Act here in Australia has been um, very carefully controlled for the good of the people because there has been a lot of um, scams going on which have made them very, very cautious as to what they include. And I think that they have, uh, have done a very good job to protect people's health. Uh, sometimes I think that once you give a, somebody a little control, they exercise over control and you have problems. And uh, over control may be an issue here where you can't get some of the things you'd like to have because of the over precaution that, they, that has been uh, manifested by concerned people. But I would try to stay within the limits of the law and I recommend that you do so. Okay, we're going to move on to vitamins. Uh, now, we're, we're now recommending a vitamin supplement because most of them contain a vitamin C, ascorbic acid, which we do not recommend. The ascorbic acid we have found to be a suppressive agent in the body. For instance, if you have a cold, you take some vitamin C and your nose stops running. So what we're recommending for people to use about three pieces of fruit a day to get a natural vitamin C in the body. Vitamin C does not store in the body, so you have to take in at least three pieces of fruit a day to have an adequate supply uh, for the regeneration of the body. Um, Any questions on that? Very detrimental. The what we have found uh, that the work of Dr. Linus Pauling is that all of the research that was done done in Pauling Laboratories, the man who was in charge of that finally quit Linus Pauling. Arthur Robinson. Arthur Robertson, Robinson. Robinson, right? Because Arthur Robinson. Uh, what he did was he found out that all of the material that he had proven, Linus Pauling would change that because he had the belief that cancer was uh, that a cancer be could be cured, anything could be cured by vitamin C. Well, so happened that Linus Pauling's own wife died of stomach cancer, and they have found that large amount of your ascorbic acid vitamin C will cause stomach cancer. And uh, these are things that are not published because it's detrimental to, to Linus Pauling's reputation. Now, back in the early 1950s, uh, Linus Pauling, when I, my studies on chemistry, he was my god, you know. Uh, he wrote beautiful textbooks that uh, I, I love because it was clear and precise. The information, as far as I was concerned, was sound. So when he came out that vitamin C was good for you and all the research was there, I sometimes would put people on 10,000 units of vitamin C a day. And they would have symptom-free, and they felt better. And then years ago, I had one of my, uh, the people I worked with from Los Angeles gave me a call on the phone and said, John, you're putting people to the, on the very verge of cancer. I said, how can you say such a thing? 
Linus Pauling says such and such and such and such. She said, look, all I'm telling you is what my findings are. You're pushing people to the very verge of cancer using your ascorbic acid. Well, I checked into it carefully. <coughs> of course, I didn't let her, anybody know that I was even considering that she may be correct. Uh, that was Hazel Bodestel from L.A. And uh, Hazel, Hazel was quite a researcher. Uh, her, her husband was in charge of the entire water system for, LA, for L.A. And that was a job, I remember staying at their home many a time. But anyway, the problem was, is that if you take your ascorbic acid vitamin C, if you have a kidney bladder infection, within a few hours the kidney bladder infection is cleared up. Cleared up. But what happens when you stop taking your stop taking your vitamin C? It comes back again, especially people who are on good nutritional programs. I scratched my head on that. Gave people vitamin C, the cold would stop. And yet I was taught, never stop a flow. And once you have the mucus flowing out of the body, whatever caused that mucus to flow, keep it flowing until it stops. And so I, here I was saying this on one hand, over here I was using vitamin C. And all of a sudden, I began to look at the eyeballs very carefully, and I found out that by looking at eyeballs on people with vitamin C, they stopped having eye color and eye structure change. That got my attention. So I stopped using ascorbic acid, vitamin C. Everybody would start going into a healing crisis again. And I was very happy with that. But what happened to their comfort zone? They no longer felt good, which vitamin C helped them feel good. It's a feel-good program that will stop a healing crisis. And that got my attention. I found that there are 22 different components of vitamin C. And if you use only one component of vitamin C, it throws the whole body out of kilter. And so what we have to take a good close look at, if it throws the body out of kilter, stopping a healing crisis, or suppressing a symptom, we're doing the wrong thing for the body. And it goes back to what Dr. Shackley said years and years ago. He said, three pieces of uh, fruit a day is all you need to maintain your body's need for vitamin C. And I believe that to be fairly accurate, except under stressful situations, you'll probably need more fruit that is organically grown to get the vitamin C that you need. There is a big question now about any fruit coming out of the United States because it is all what? Radiated. And that radiated fruit is detrimental to your health. And so I wouldn't buy, I wouldn't touch a thing coming out of the States because it's all irradiated to kill everything in it to prolong the shelf life. And all of you know what the radiation will do, just like in a, um, a microwave. It'll change the material genetically so it becomes carcinogenic for the body. This has all been proven now, and it's just a matter of time before it all gets out to the people. Yes? What about bioflavonoids? A what? Bioflavonoids. Bio? Bioflavonoids. Bio oh, oh bi uh, that's a part of your vitamin C complex. Just eat the white part of the orange. Okay, but that's something that the body does require. Yes? That's absolutely correct. Well, this is where you have your fresh, organically grown vitamin C, and you know you're going to get, hopefully, you're going to get something of value. That's why you have fruit trees on your property. <laughs> Any form of vitamin C, you test it out, becomes, if you've got a cold, you take your vitamin C, what happens to your cold? I, I understand what it stops it. It stops the flow. It becomes suppressive to the body. So whatever form of vitamin C that you get that's made in the laboratory, it's going to be suppressive to the system.
Why did I use 10,000 milligrams a day? Please, I, 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 have, I can't throw rocks at anybody. We're all taken in by the hype that we're given by, the, by all of the health dealers. I was taken in, I believed it hook, line, and sinker. I can't, I can't throw rocks at any of the nature paths who believed as I believed. Yep. And then you probably go into a healing crisis. Go through it and b <laughs> join the club. <laughs> yeah. See, most of us love to preserve our comfort zones. And this is a hard thing that we have to deal with. If you have a nature path that's into pain, they'll lose business because they'll lose 95% of their business because what do most people want to do? They want to feel good all the time so they can continue doing the thing that's making them die slowly. Okay? Say that again. That's not true. It's certainly well not. That is stuff from, from Pauling. And that's been taught, uh, taught for a long, long time. And, uh, and we know from, from the, from the uh, uh, what, there's a big statement in the, uh, the Executive Intelligence Review on vitamin C by, uh, by uh, Arthur Robinson. And he points it out very clearly that it doesn't boost the immune system. That's a fable. It suppresses it. It suppresses the immune system. The synthetic the natural will. Pardon? The natural will. The natural will help to enhance because it's coming from a natural live source. But anything made in the laboratory will suppress the immune system, contrary to what you read about in all the literature. Anything else on vitamin C? Okay, uh, now vitamin D, also we have to be careful of synthetic forms of vitamin D, which some are actually steroids. So we recommend to get the vitamin D about approximately about 20 minutes of sunlight a day. You will get the vitamin D through the oils on your skin. Now for those people that go into the shower and lather up, you're not going to be getting your vitamin D because you're taking off all the natural oils right off your skin. Yes. Okay, well, I'm getting to... Yeah. I was going to talk about niacin. Let's simply talk about sunscreen. That's the biggest myth that you can possibly imagine by telling people that the ultraviolet rays are not good for the body. Don't believe it. Just simply don't believe it and don't use your sunscreen. Get your skin healthy and then you can handle whatever type of sun that you're out under. Okay, let's put it this way. When you get your skin healthy, when the hair starts coming back into its natural color, and the skin becomes healthy and well, you're going to lose all of the blemishes which the ultraviolet will cause the AGE, the aging marks on your skin, your brown pigmentations and so on, which are caused by the collagen cross-linking due to the influence of your high amounts of ultraviolet, provided that the body is ill. If the body is healthy and well, all of those age marks will go away. Okay, the skin becomes healthy and well. And the only thing that, that if you're going to stay out in the sun for three or four hours at a time, then you might get a sunburn. But most of the time, if you take good care of your skin and have a good and healthy and don't stay out there all day in the sun, your skin will be healthy, you'll never get a skin cancer. Okay? If you do get a skin cancer, you'll know how to handle it. There's things right now that you can take, put a little dot on a, 
on a skin cancer and has healed up and gone away in, within uh, two weeks' time. And a lot of people are using this uh, uh, type of this little salve. One drop, and it activates the skin cancer. Doug's seen it activated, and it's, it's completely gone. Now, there's not a thing to worry about. The thing to worry about is the approaches that the pharmaceutical firms are using with the sunscreen. It's big money. We, we grow our, our gardens organically and we don't put sunscreen on any of our fruit trees or lemon ice fruit or... <laughs> no sunscreen <laughs> on your vegetables? No, and they're growing beautifully. Except a little bit of shade cloth and the sun gets too hot over the top of the vegetables. Sure, that's big money for the, for the medical industry. It's a policy to pick out something every so often to keep people going back to the medical doctors. It's, it's programmed that way. Sure. Sure, it's a fear syndrome that they're p purporting uh, foisting, shall we say, on an unaware public. The best thing you can do in that area is to get good, correct, get good, correct information yourself, and apply it. And a lot of times, the the, the best way to, to bring about change is to just set a good example yourself. I mean, apply the apply these principles yourself. Other people gradually are going to notice your example, and you get a bit of a of a groundswell that way. I mean, you know, you just go about where you're going out in the sun without a sunscreen and you're you're doing fine. I mean, eventually en enough people are going to start seeing you and realizing that you know that it's a big that it's a big lie that's been that's been foisted on people. The thing to realize with the sun for your good health, you need the sun, you need the sun on the skin to a certain extent. I mean, not to the point of burning yourself, but to uh, you know, to enjoy good health, you need exposure on the skin on a fairly regular basis. And you need exposure to, through the eyes for the for the entire endocrine system to work properly because you have your pineal gland, which governs your entire endocrine system, which is light sensitive. So you're saying you shouldn't wear sunglasses? Absolutely never. not. No. Never, never. Get throw out your sunglasses. I went up to uh, to uh, the uh, to Alaska about five years ago to do some to do some seminars up there. And Alaska, for those of you that don't know, is way way north in the in the U.S. And I was up there in. Uh, month of May, so they've just been through their, their winter there, where they get very, very little sunlight for, you know, you know, four or five or six months out of the year. And one of the things I noticed, I did, I did about 40 or 50 eye readings while I was up there, and looked at a great many other eyes, just in terms of people in the seminar and getting people plugged in on points and all. I looked at a lot of eyes, and I, I, remember, I remember being struck by the fact that, that virtually every single person I looked at had a really, in the sclera, had a really, really heavy stress line coming down towards the pineal. I mean, it wasn't just like one or two here or there. It was like person after person after person. And I'm just thinking to myself, what is going on here? I mean, you know, normally in a seminar of, you know, 30 or 40 people, you'll see a few of those, but not every single person. And it wasn't until, you know, until about the second or third day that I, that I was there that it finally dawned on me that what I was seeing was the effects, you know, because these were people that had lived in Alaska for years. I was seeing the effects of, of uh, basically being deprived of sunlight for half the year. And it was the, the pineal glands were, were really, uh, you know, in great disarray as a, re, as a result of that. Um, I want to mention something here very, very briefly on, on back to the skin and the sunlight. Um, the ability of your body to utilize the sun's rays, it depends on a number of different nutritional factors. And one of the factors that you really need to be aware of is that you need to have the essential fatty acids your omega-3 and your omega-6, in order for your body to properly receive the, sun, the sun's energies. 
And if you want to, if you want to uh, do a little bit of reading on this, I'd suggest you get a copy of some of the writings of Dr. Joanna Budwig, B-U-D-W-I-G, uh, who's a German lady who's done most, really most of the valid research in the field of fats and oils is basically what she's been doing over the last 50 years. I think it's actually more than that, but many, many nominations for the Nobel Prize. You know, just about every year, you know, in, in the last decade or so, she gets nominated for the Nobel Prize. Uh, she'll probably never win it because she's telling the truth. She's an unconventional medical doctor. She's been hauled through the courts in Germany over the last 40 or 50 years on numerous occasions by the oil industry, and she, win she eventually wins her, wins her case every single time, but it always ends up costing her, you know, huge amounts of money. She always wins, though, because she's telling the truth. But basically what, what Budwig says is that the sun's rays are, the, are coming in at, a, at certain frequencies. You know, the photons you know, from, the sun, you know, from, the, from the rays of the sun are, are oscillating at certain, or vibrating at certain frequencies. And in order for you to receive, uh, if, you're, if you think of, uh, use like radio as an analogy, in order to receive a, a certain frequency, you need the right length antenna. You know, you need the right, the right type of antenna. And what Budwig says basically is that the antenna that you need to receive the, uh, the, the photons of the sun is you need the essential fatty acids because they're basically in resonance with the sun's energy. So this is the, this is the reason why, mo why most people in this day and age, are ha or one of the reasons why in this day and age so many people are having problems with the sun. It's not the sun's fault. It's the same old sun it's always been. It's the fact that most people are horribly deficient in the essential fatty acids, and their system's completely clogged up with all these unnatural fats from the, from the margarines and the hydrogenated oils and all the rest. Budwig reports that Which? you can... Okay. Margarine. Uh, how many of you here think mud, margarine's better than butter? More healthy. Anybody? Okay, margarine's one of the big... is another one of the big lies out there. I, I didn't see any hands up there. That's good. <laughs> margarine's one of the... Margarine... What's that? Mar oh, okay. Mar margarine is one of the most destructive items out there in the supermarket. It's, and, and hydrogenated oils in general. They're, they're, they're fake fats. They're basically plastic fats, artificially hardened fats, and they should, they should never be consumed in any quantity if you can avoid it. But basically, we're, we've, we've all filled ourselves up with all sorts of unnatural altered fats from the ways that these you know, rancid fats and... and uh, trans fatty acids and all sorts of altered fat molecules that have clogged up the system, and we, we're not getting enough of the of the of the, uh, the valuable essential fatty acids in a non-rancid form. And so basically, what the problem is is we just don't have the right we just don't have the right antennas anymore to receive the sun's energies. If you can correct those nutritional problems, you'll find a huge difference in your ability to tolerate sunlight. Budwig reports with her cancer patients all of whom are essential, ad, uh, essential fatty acid deficient, that within two to three days of getting on the flax oil, they tolerate the sunlight marvel marvelously. In fact, they begin to crave it, where prior to that, they absolutely can't go out in the sun for any length of time. So the thing is, if you want to be able to handle the sunlight, that's one of the factors you've got to deal with, is getting your, you know, getting your flax oil so you can get your essential fatty acids. It's Not the same percentages. The to get the with your essential fatty acids, and there is a there is a section. There's a page or two there in the patient's guide where, where a lot of this information is summarized. But you need to get high levels of both the omega three and the omega six. And the omega three is the one that's much harder to get. And what happens with a lot of people is that the the ratio of the six to the three has to, can't get too high. Most people have way too much six and not enough of the omega three. And flax oil is really the, about the only thing out there that really uh, has a high enough percentage of omega-3, where it's up to like 55 or 65 percent omega-3. Does the flax oil have all the other things that germ has in it, like, you know, all these sterols? I'm not knocking wheat germ. I'm just saying it's not going to give you enough, it's not going to give you anywhere near enough omega-3. It's, it's going to have, I'm not knocking it at all, provided it's not rancid. Yeah. Oh, but. Okay. It just is not going to be a, va a, a, a very vital source of omega-3, that's all. There's very few of the seeds and nuts that have sufficient quantities of, of omega-3 to be really worthwhile, you know, to be made into oils. And next to flaxseed, the next best thing is maybe, you know, where flax, flax oil will be like 55 to 65 percent omega-3, the next best is down around 10 to 15. It's much, much, much lower. 
So there's really nothing like flax oil if you're trying to get your essential fatty acids. There's only two. There's only two essential fatty acids. Linoleic acid is omega-6. It's the same thing. There's only two essential fatty acids. If the body has sufficient enzyme levels in the tissues, which is one of the main things we address here, your body can synthesize any of the other types of fats that you'll need out of the omega-3 and the omega-6, provided you've got you know, the enzyme levels to do it. And with the vast quantity of enzymes that, we're all, that we recommend people take, that's not a, that's not a problem at all. You'll, you'll have no problem synthesizing any of the other. Uh, it's like, just like with the amino acids. You've got a certain number of essential ones. With the fatty acids, you have essential ones, but there's, there's actually only two of them, the, the three and the six. Um, I don't know how many other people saw a program on uh, television we get, Brisbane channels, within the last week or so. There was a representative of a medical laboratory, and they're talking on uh, mandatory immunization ahead for children. And they were saying the first uh, six months or before school, and some schools I know of people complained who don't like immunisation. I'm, I'm no expert on immunology. Uh, won't accept the children at school unless they've had the triple antigen, all this. Now they were saying that, all right, the children have that. When they get up to 11, 12, close to puberty, they're getting together a vaccination against chlamydia, sexually transmitted diseases, and that should be mandatory. And I feel we should look after our children with diet and supplements and, and education uh, of the correct uh, moral behaviours rather than polluting the body with this. And I think that would be, well, a wicked sin if that was ever brought in. <laughs> I want to talk. I'm going to talk on a subject that you need to understand. In my time when I was in the States, I was on the board of directors of Rife Laboratories where we had the Royal Rife instrumentation in our hands that we had, were checking it over and trying to develop a frequency to knock out the AIDS virus. Okay, this is our goal. Dr. Robert Strecker, have you heard of the Strecker Memorandum? He was on the board of directors, and his dead brother, who was a liar, who exposed this whole uh, Strecker problem, Ted Strecker, uh, Ted searched in very carefully and found out that the AIDS virus was made in Fort Detrick, Maryland, from your sheep visna and your bovine leukemia virus. And uh, he showed how you took the various viral material and spliced them and put them together and all of a sudden there you have the AIDS virus. That was made in Fort Detrick, Maryland by the World Health Organization. Are you hearing me? Okay, one of the board of directors, whose name is Bruce, worked in Zaire in Africa. He was in charge of inoculating the entire country of Zaire with the smallpox vaccination. Well, I'm telling you how my side of it. Now, just listen. Now, Bruce told me point blank that he was told by his superior not to worry about this particular smallpox, that it, that it was inoculated with another material, which was a flu-like virus, but it would only affect black people. It would, was pigment-specific and would only affect black people. And that the black people was... It was found out later on that the black people would get the AIDS virus that was made in Fort Detrick, Maryland. Eighty million people in Africa were inoculated with this particular brand of your smallpox vaccination laced with the AIDS virus. And this is why you have whole populations and whole cities completely dead today because of the AIDS virus. The only thing that foiled the plans of the World Health Organization in their genocide of the black people of Africa. The only thing that foiled their plans was the fact that the AIDS virus mutated so rapidly that it would mutate and mutate into harmless strains so that people would no longer be subject to a, what they call a viral form of the AIDS virus that would destroy them. 
The same thing happened among the homosexual population in the United States. Uh, New York, 2,000 homosexuals were inoculated with hepatitis B serum laced with the AIDS virus. Are you hearing me? Same thing happened with Louisiana. The same thing happened in San Francisco. And these people are all dead, including the people that did the inoculation. Now, what I'm trying to point out is I no longer can trust the World Health Organization who has openly laid plans for the reduction of the world's population down 90% by deciding, by a bunch of elitists up there, deciding who are we going to inoculate today and who are we going to destroy? What country do we need to knock over? Let's go down to Australia and inoculate everybody down there with a huge inoculation program and get rid of the Australians so the Asian can go down there and raise rice paddies. Hey, pardon me, folks. But this is the type of politics that the elitists are working on, and they're determined to have mass genocide for certain groups of people that they feel are no longer viable for a one-world government. Have you heard anything about one-world government? How many, how many people here have heard that there's a one-world government where they're determined to, to eliminate about 90% of the world's population? Okay, may I tell you this very carefully? I've seen the maps. I've seen the maps for resettling and restructuring the entire United States. I've seen the maps which have been written and, and, and uh, printed under the auspices of the Rockefeller Organization so that the United States eventually is destined by the year 2000 to have 10% of its current population. Who's going to choose which 90% of the people are going to get wiped out? Okay. I've seen the plans for that also. I don't want to bury you too much about that. But this is, this is planned from the top down by elitists to determine who's going to die. You know something? I don't really care about people trying to tell me who's going to die and who's not going to die because I know as much as they know about life and they have no right to foist their opinions and their genocide te techniques on people. They're doing it already. In Maui, Hawaii, there was one man that was there that worked for the World Health Organization that developed the AIDS virus, which would be only yellow specific. And when he spoke openly, he got murdered. And that was over on Baldwin Avenue. And he got murdered one night because he was opening up too much about what he knew about the, about the World Health Organization and their pigment-specific vaccines that they were using to obliterate the yellow race, to obliterate the black race. Hey, how about that, folks? Please consider. I don't think any monstrosity or group of idiots has the right to do that. And that's what the elitists today are. And the people who are in charge of one world government are involved with genocide today. You want to trust them? Trust them as far as you can throw them, and that's how much you can trust them. Please consider that. Stand up, dear, please, and talk to us. Oh, I'll sit here. I have a relative that's actually working in AIDS research at the moment, trying to find a cure. And I was only speaking to him about a month ago, and he said that they've found a cure that they've tried out in Africa, but it's only pigment. It's only working on the black population, not the white population. So I just thought I'd throw that one in after what you had said, John. But with the immunisation schedule, I run baby clinics, and um, they're currently advising that uh, the babies get uh, the triple antigen, plus the uh, hepatitis B, plus the polio, uh, plus the measles, plus the chicken pox, and all this sort of thing. And also, just to let you know, if you do wish your child not to be immunised, and uh, I could probably get my head cut off for this, you do have the right. You, all you have to do is sign a piece of paper that says your child is not immunised and agree to take your child away from the school if there happens to be an outbreak. And it's that simple. But the, th but the thing is, is if you oxygenate the human body properly, 
and raise the immune system of the human body, it'll knock out any of these viral problems that you don't have to inoculate for. Okay, you increase the oxygen level in the body. As they have proven over and over again, Germany has done its research. The United States has done its research, but the, uh, the, the Food and Drug Administration will not allow it on how any viral material can be destroyed by a high oxygen level in the bloodstream. Pardon me? Any oxygen, uh, any viral material can be destroyed, including the AIDS virus, by oxygen. And they're using ozone therapy to do that. And it's not allowed in Queensland. It's not allowed in Australia. It's being utilized in some uh, places very quietly. But if it's found out that it's being utilized, those medical people will lose their license. Back to, na back to nature. John. Being what? Uh, there's a lot of problems with that being uh, introduced intravenously. Uh, there are techniques which are now afoot where they take the, uh, take the blood out of the body, run it through a very carefully regulated ozone ozone odor or ozonator and it oxygenates the blood and puts it back into the body again and uh, this has been very very effective and they have destroyed the virus causing hepatitis B hepatitis A hepatitis C okay that's already been done that's no longer a problem and from Syracuse University where this has been applied they're saying it's now able to handle any case of your AIDS virus now that's a little little heavy because it's different the new equipment that they're having in the states is different than the German uh, German uh, method methodology is that the polyatomic therapy unit? the which one polyatomic therapy. that's the chair where it comes out one side and goes around and back in it's a bit like a kidney yeah that, that that's my understanding that that would be that equipment I, I just wanted to say something about oxygen in general here Anita made the statement right at the, right the get-go here that we need enzymes, minerals, vitamins, amino acids, essential fatty acids, and oxygen. We need all of those things. And even that's just a start, but we need all of those things in order for the body to be healthy. And in answer to your question of is there any problem with, you know, say, the ozone and the other oxygen therapies, I personally think the greatest danger is that people think that that's all you have to do that all you have to do is put lots of oxygen into the body and you'll cure everything. I know of a doctor back in the States, one of, one of my students back in the States worked with this doctor, and this doctor himself had ozone equipment and was in the business of ozonating people. And this doctor himself had, you know, was completely off the chart as far as his own oxygen levels in his blood because he was continually administering you know, all sorts of oxygen to himself. He still died of cancer. Why? Well, he was enzyme deficient, he was mineral deficient, he had a terrible diet and, and all the rest. So the thing about it is, is don't, don't make the mistake that a lot of people are making of thinking that all you have to do is get oxygen into the system because you've got to do all the, you got to do everything else too. And this is what Dr. Johanna Budvig pointed out, it's just not the essential fatty acid. It's a full range of enzymes and minerals and so on, which she recommends also. John, you had your hand up, sir. Yes, sir. And uh, somebody also mentioned uh, uh, sodium chloride. Yes, sir. How do you feel about those? I don't know. I use them both. <laughs> I used to not use hydrogen peroxide because as a chemist, I look at that double bond on that hydrogen peroxide and that become very, very corrosive. Okay? 
When that double bond comes loose, that oxygen is going to bind to anything. But on the other hand, where some people say that this becomes a um, detrimental to the health of the body, others say, from their research, it becomes healthy to the body as a scavenger. And, uh, and I find that I think both things are true. On one hand, you're throwing something into the system that's bad for you. On the other hand, you're using it properly in smaller amounts and it becomes a, a health enhancer for the body. So you have to kind of look at the arguments, look at them both ways, and then use hydrogen peroxide, for example, in very small dosages and build up over a period of time, and you have wonderful results with it. It's very inexpensive. And many people who are using it have used it for years with no harmful side effects whatsoever. It's the misuse of it is where you have the problems. Pardon? Uh, the same thing. Now, there are some people who claim that this is very harmful to the body. Uh, we, we've used your sodium chloride for many, many years with no harm to the body. Now, probably a good 15 years. And, uh, from, uh, and we've used it where we have needed to build up the oxygen level in the body. And we've had, uh, for example, uh, with dengue fever, which is a very dangerous uh, mosquito-borne um, problem in the Cook Islands and some of the other tropical areas. You even have it here from time to time in, uh, in Queensland and uh, Ross River. You, you put a person heavily on your... Um, on oxygen and your proteolytic enzymes and give them some good adjustments and they're out working again within three or four hours symptom free now this is a little heavy duty because we've been able to do this with many cases of uh, dengue fever people sicker than dogs and we've helped them tremendously the oxygen knocks out the viral material the symptoms go it's beautiful any infections. We've had people who, uh, they had uh, a gangrene and they want to cut the leg off, oxygenate the body, boost the immune system with the mature green papaya. And within a short time, the gangrene starts disappearing. Use the point holding, especially to put the nerve supply and circulation back in the system through the STO point, which we, we're not going to go into the technology here. But there's enough people now, there's a, uh, on a whole bunch of people now in Australia that are trained and can teach these things and do a good job of it. Now, you have the you have these things into the body, and you don't have to cut the leg off. You don't have to cut the leg off below the knee. Then you don't have to cut the ankle off. Then you don't have to cut the toes off. And after a while, everything's back to normal again, and the gangrene is gone. And so, oftentimes, when you're dealing with the point holding. You're dealing also with the uh, diabetic condition that brought on the gangrene. And, uh, and this, this is also cleared up gradually. Okay, moving on to uh, vitamin A. Just a couple little factors here which affect vitamin A. Uh, I don't know if any of you out there are working in offices with fluorescent lights. The fluorescent lights, you'll feel very tired by the end of the day, and this drains out your vitamin A from the body. So uh, in the States, we have a light called the full-spectrum lighting, and there are tube lights, and uh, if your, your boss is able to be persuaded to change them, I did in my office in San Francisco, I took out the tubes over my office, uh, about one tube in front, uh, one four tubes in front, four over my head, and four in back, and I just replaced them all with full-spectrum lights, and I just found the difference really quickly. I just had a question. Is it the, would, you're saying that the, is it the, um, the fact that it's a fluorescent or the fact that it's not a full-spectrum fluorescent that's, that's doing away with your vitamin A? Because right. well, okay. this is, I haven't heard this before, and I'm, I, I just, the fact that it's uh, not full spectrum, okay. yeah, it's the full range of light that the body needs. And when we get a certain segment of light, that's where we get deficiencies in the body. So, uh, uh, yes.
through her. <laughs> well, I'm shouting now <laughs> for uh, all you people in offices who are feeling tired at the end of the day. You might want to talk your boss into changing the lights. I paid for them myself, and I just got them in because it really was a difference. Uh, if you're drinking a lot of carrot juice for beta carotene, uh, make sure that you have the acidophilus in your system, or you won't be able to assimilate the beta carotene from the carrot juice. That is necessary there. Uh, with uh, vitamin E, we do put some people on vitamin E supplements, those that are really depleted. Make sure it's a natural form of vitamin E, mixed tocopherols. Uh, tocopherols is T-O-C-O-P-H-E-R-O-L-S. And the natural form will have a D in front of it. The synthetic will have D-L in front of it. That would be fine, but I'd also put the acidophilus in. Yes. Okay. I'd also put them on full program myself, uh, enzymes, minerals. How small are you talking about? Where you're still breastfeeding or? You have to go back to the mother then. How was the baby born? Cesarean? Normal delivery, no problem. I don't know what I'm talking about, but the second thoracic vertebrae is out. Yeah, but the second thoracic vertebrae is out. It's shutting off nerve supply to the bronchioles and lungs. In this case. Also, the mother has to check her diet. I don't know what kind of diet she's on. That's very important also. Yes. Are you using an acidophilus now? No. no. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, well, Enzymes International has the full range of nutrients that I am talking about. And I can put that address up on the board for you later, for everyone, or tomorrow. Uh, they have the full range of supplements that we're talking about. There's also probably, if you go into the health food store, uh, if you understand muscle testing, you could probably find some good brands right in the health food store. You want to say something right? If it makes yogurt, it's good acidophilus. Okay. Now, yes. How much acidophilus should I If you're a coffee and tea drinker, which strips the uh, acidophilus from the system, I would say one, three times a day. Oh, one capsule three times a day. Uh, if you're not a coffee or tea drinker, probably one one time a day. There are no contraindications from taking too much. Yeah. But you have to have that acidophilus in the system to help with the synthesizing of the various materials in the in the gut, in the small intestine. <coughs> Pardon me? That's my next comment, <laughs> if I may talk about that for a few minutes, okay?
just uh, I just want to talk straight, okay, for a few minutes, if I may. We are it. We are in a very critical time in the evolution of planet Earth right now. And right at the present time, we have no assurance at this moment that we are going to avoid a nuclear catastrophe at this point of time. Because the amount of fear and the amount of anger and the amount of literal hatred that's taking place between religions, between races, between various cultures and so on, is increasing almost exponentially, which wasn't quite that way, say, a year or two ago. A year or two ago, their things looked rather optimistically. It looks like we're, we're not heading into uh, catastro catastrophic problems. Right now, the Arab nations have entered into contracts with China. I don't know if you're aware of this or not, for nuclear armaments, which are building up not only the Syrian, but the Iranian armament uh, catches, if you want to call it that, their, their armaments. China has been going into a program uh, where they have developed the technology to deliver biological and chemical warfare in limited amounts to different countries for different purposes. This is on a scale far greater than the United States or Russia has ever developed. And China is now using these per materials to uh, arm, shall we say, the Muslims. The reason that China is doing this is for their own protection because they are no longer protected on their north and on their west uh, by another communist country. And so China is still a very dedicated communist nation. And they feel the only way that they can gain allies is with strange bedfellows, which happens to be the Muslims. So the Muslims have entered into a pact that they will not disturb the Chinese situation if China will arm them properly with atomic weaponry. Now, China and the Muslims both have one united enemy, and that is Europe and the, the one world government type situation. Are you aware of that? Are you aware how they hate the, the, the United States, they hate the Europeans, and they're dedicated through their jihad, through their holy war, it's not a matter of when it's going to come. It is if it comes, not if it comes, when it comes. And they're fully dedicated for the destruction of any other nation other than Islam, except for China, by pact, because China is helping the Muslim, and that excludes them. And also within China are a number of Muslim uh, smaller nations and groups. So about one-fourth of China are infiltrated, fairly infiltrated with, with your Muslim faith. So there's some problems here that are entering in that they're entering into. Okay? Now, when Chernobyl went off a few years ago, it devastated a number of different countries as far as their health was concerned because of radioactive fallout. Now, more and more is coming out about that. I worked very carefully, both Anita and I worked with Cliff Sanderson and his wife, who is Russian. Uh, they go over to, um, he's a Kiwi, uh, but he goes over continually about over into Russia, works in Moscow in the hospitals and so on, with the radiation victims of, of the uh, fallout from Chernobyl. In white Russia, the capital of which is Minsk, there's not one child un under the age of 10 that is normal. They all have either leukemia, they all have cancer, they all have genetic deformities that are unbelievable, they're all sick, and they're all dying. 
and people don't understand this. Now, if there is another nuclear disaster, which according to the statistics of the various um, aging energy plants like Chernobyl, if that were to happen, it would just literally destroy Russia. And from everything that is indicated as Russia continues to deteriorate, then you're going to have more and more of these trouble spots that are not carefully looked at and major problems could happen. So we're going to have to look at the first line of defense, and that's the health of our bodies. And let's talk now about niacin relative to this. When you take niacin, Joan, don't you run off. <laughs> I need you. When you take niacin into your system, along with your enzymes and your minerals and other nutrients in saturation. When you have a niacin flush, you take your clothes off and stand in front of the mirror and you see the outlines of old swimsuits, old radiation burns. If any of you have done any welding, you'll find the radiation from, from welding on, on the different shirts that you wore where the, the welding burns will be there on your body. And you'll have continual numbers of radiation burns on your body that you will re-experience and you go back earlier and earlier in your life and every sunburn you've ever had you'll re-experience it and then eventually you get into genetic memory and that becomes a little bit more disastrous because the healing crisis don't get easier they get worse until actually what you're doing then when you get back into genetic memory you start having dreams of nuclear wars and nuclear explosions and devastating of your skin, slowly rotting off of your body and so on, things like this that have happened. Now, it's not over there that's causing the nuclear wars. It is the crystals within our own bodies that we haven't re-experienced and released ourselves from those resistances that in, are in a state of creation 24 hours a day. Now let me lay it on you straight. It's not those guys over there that's causing a nuclear war. It is a manifestation of our own lack of consciousness because we want to preserve our comfort zones in such a way that we don't have to go through pain. If you get a good niacin flush, you're going to have the pain of old sunburns for maybe 15, 20 minutes, half an hour, until the niacin flush no longer has an effect upon you. And you can go up to about 1,000 milligrams for a dosage with no harmful side effects on the body. During the Second World War, the American government did a lot of research on guinea pigs called human beings took the old buck privates out and they took them and would divide them in two groups. And one group would give them niacin. They give them nutrients such as an iron supplement, a calcium supplement, and a vitamin supplement, plus the niacin. And they'd take and increase their niacin, supplement, uh, uh, niacin dosage every day up to 3,000 milligrams a day, which was maximum, which is also maximum for treating schizophrenia very effectively, I might add. And they would take the people who were treated with the niacin and line them up along with a bunch of buck privates over here that had no niacin and no supplementation. They bear their bodies to the blast of the atomic bomb there at Bikini, uh, Mamini, Bikini. <laughs> uh, and they'd, uh, they'd bear their bodies and take on the full blast of the atomic radiation and the ones that were prepared with niacin had no reaction to radiation they were radiation resistant there were people in Yokohama Nagasaki that lived on a steady diet of um, of rice bran which is high in niacin 
And these people were right in the center of the bomb blast and were never affected by the radiation from the fallout, while everyone else was seared and, and pashimmeled, you know, by the, by the radiation. Now, it is my belief that if we are contributing because of the crystals in our own body, which are in generation 24 hours a day that we haven't dealt with yet, and we're able then to eliminate that from our being by taking niacin on a regular dosage and take out and re-experience all of the old sunburns that we've had, chances are very, very good that we'll be radiation resistant if there happens to be a nuclear war. At the present time, you've got millions of army personnel lining up on the Kashmir borders from the Pakistani side and other millions of Indian soldiers in Kashmir, Jammu area, to, to repel any possible invasion by the Pakistanis. And waiting to pick up the pieces is the largest buildup of military personnel and armor that you've ever had in China, just north of the Kashmiri uh, border bordering China. And China's getting ready to pick up the pieces. Now, you're not going to have a buildup of manpower and armor without using it. And this is a buildup of unprecedented proportions in both India and Pakistan. It's a huge thing waiting to happen and both of them have nuclear power and uh, nuclear potential. And each one is weighing the first strike potential right now. Pakistan especially is looking at a first strike possibility of, of uh, hitting India first before India hits them. And they're considering it. Please consider that, folks. Okay? Now, if this does happen, all of a sudden we're into the throes of destruction because the mindset of the people will be of such a nature that we cannot, evol cannot evade or delay a nuclear holocaust. Now, please consider that. My belief is... <coughs> And it's just a belief at this point of time. It's not a certainty. But I know that the future is not set in concrete. But if we can have a revival of health of our bodies first, which dissolve the crystallizations in the physical body, which then allow us to re-experience the thought, feeling, and spoken word on a mental body level, and release that with unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness. Morphogenetically at that point, we can create... Come on in, David! Morphogenetically, we can create such a condition that these things will not happen. And I believe that that, that is possible. But it's not going to sit idly by where we use just a lot of mental chatter and a lot of mental speculation without a lot of deep excavation, which will be painful. And that's why, hopefully, we're here, that we can do something collectively under the direction of the people who have been trained in this work sufficiently that a lot of good can be done in the removal not only of our own blockages, but the blockages of those people that we can affect morphogenetically who we're related to at some DNA level. I think the whole future of our world depends upon a revival toward love and forgiveness. I see no other way for survival. I just want to share this with you. Because when we're talking about niacin, we're not just talking about something that is affecting the physical body. We're talking about something that's helping to remove all the blockages pertaining to suppressed traumas in relationship to radiation that has been going on for countless centuries. I remember in Lebanon they discovered this huge greenish glass fused area that the scientists were called in to look at and they had this huge pad there and they said the only thing that could ever cause that would be atomic, uh, atomic power. 
that had to be maybe 20, 30,000 years ago. Consider. So all we're doing is we're coming up to a cycle again of a possibility where we have a choice. And we have a choice to survive and learn how to love and get along with one another, or we have a choice to die with hatred and anger and a lot of uh, another cataclysm that we will suffer right along with our brothers and sisters who have forgotten how much they could love at one time. I want to share that with you. So this niacin business here is not just niacin. It's, a, it's looking at a broad range of potential as to what we can do to be of service not only to ourselves, but to our, our relatives, our friends, our brothers and sisters, if I can bring it right down that close to home. Does this bother you, my talking this way? Okay, it should. <laughs> it should. To take action. That's what, take action. It should bother you sufficiently to get this stuff under your belt. There's all kinds of videotapes available on information on body electronics now. There's all kinds of people trained that you can get in and start working with these folks. And then all support each other and get a lot of things accomplished that, that is, will be more than valuable for all of you. Yes? Niacinamide is not niacin. It does not give you a flush. It doesn't have the same effect upon the body. I want you to use B3 niacin. Yes. There's a lady who sells um, a pure source of it, and she'll send it to you. Um, there's a lady up on the front side of that, that will send you a pure form of the um, nicotinic acid. Nicotinic acid, acid is proper. Okay. Uh, if there's somebody that's selling that and... Uh, it's available. Wonderful. Yes. Once a day is sufficient. That's about right. We're in the same boat. But uh, if you're doing it once a day, uh, leave it at that. Now you may want go to a nature path. Go to a nature path and and check out your niacin level, your B complex levels, and so on, and then. Go on up and move up to a 2,000 oh, per day. Yeah. Uh, but don't go higher than 3,000 per day. But don't do it without, oh, some, without support of somebody who knows what, what, what you're doing. But we have some people who take 3,000 a day, they get nothing now, but they always complement it with a high okay. B-complex level to balance up the niacin. Yes? That's about right. There's nothing wrong with you. It's the fact that morphogenetically, people are able to take more and more niacin and get better results than ever before in our history. Because morphogenetically, everyone is being affected in a positive way. Um, I'd like to need it to continue on. Yes. No, full, full, prog full program of point holding, of nutrition, and so on. Oftentimes with schizophrenia, you have a lot of radii salaris up in the brain area. And their schizy attitude will begin to diminish as the radii salaris move gradually inward using the proper program. Now, the old orthodox iridologist will tell you if you have these radii salaris, you have to live with that because that will never move. And that is absolutely incorrect. Any structure in the iris of the eye changes. The color changes gradually from dark chocolate brown to blue in all cases. Now, may I disturb you a little bit racially? You take, the, you take the blackest people out of Africa, okay, and you start them on a heavy program, and gradually their eyes will start lightening up in color, and their skin will start lightening up. I know of people whose skin is no darker than mine right now who started out with, black, with this uh, royal violet black skin. 
And one time, this one lady, she's a, pardon me? Well, Michael Jackson did it another way. But we have many, many people who, when you get the black people on the table and you start working with them, you find out that there is a spirit occupying their body which is identical to your own. And if there's any racial, racialism, racism here where we have people who are into body electronics that call all the aboriginals nothing but a bunch of black bastards, I tell you I get on their case a little bit for, for this type of racial attitude because uh, they say that the blacks have no more spirit than a rabbit has. Well, how about a person who's half Aboriginal or 16th Aboriginal or, you know, part Maori or p part, part Negro or... Uh, you follow what I'm saying? Where are you going to draw, to draw the line as to how far racism goes? Now, I don't want any racism here among the work in body electronics. What you do is your business. But remember, you're dealing with a human soul that is eternal in its nature and racism has to come to an end. Um, shall we call it a cultural bigotry has to come to an end. And we have to look at every human being as our brother and our sister, regardless of what race, what color, or what creed they adhere to. You're always going to have people that are going to differ with one another. So they differ with one another. Can't we agree to disagree and do it peacefully without having enemies created from it? There's enough enemies already around this earth. But in body electronics, you can get the Arabs and the Jews together, and they end up at the very, very best of friends until you get into political and, and a religious discussion. And then the fur flies, and they part enemies. It's not necessary, folks. Somebody has to stop and work on unconditional love and unconditional forgiveness with no exceptions and no conditions. John, sir. Yes, sir. There's a story about an American military person in the late 40s. That's right, sir. I've never heard. That's a story that you totally believe. Yes, sir. No question about it whatsoever. Now, you might say I'm as radical and a quack as you can find, but I have other people who will back me up on, on, on that story. That's coming right from the military coming right from the sources of, uh, of what will happen if we don't control our radiation and atomic energy. We have to have an end to it. We have to have a ban on it. Now, I have some other material I don't have here uh, on some work that was done by a man that I consider to be one of the greatest geniuses of our time, a Walter Russell. He said back in 1945 and predicted that if radiation were to continue, the radiation affects, through biological transmutation, the oxygen level in the earth, and it will deplete the <coughs> oxygen level in the earth, and the time will come when you'll have immune system problems, you'll have leukemias, and so on, which we have today. Okay? Now, all of that is there. But what, what uh, Admiral Byrd and his work, that's all there. And that is the diary directly when it came from. That came from Admiral Byrd to his nephew. His nephew gave it to a top U.S. scientist who then gave it to Virgil Armstrong. Virgil Armstrong is a, a friend of a very good friend of ours. And uh, you remember? Who did he find out? Uh, remember the fellow that was the top scientist that attended our seminars in Maui? The little guy with the, that did all the hiking. He's is is in his late 60s and retired. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. No names. All right. The, the thing is, is he was the one that was I'm at a, a, a meeting of top scientists in the United States, of which he is one. And all this was then given out at that time uh, and put on tape. I have the tape. Okay? I had that printed right word from word, right from the tape. Now, that's valid material, sir. That's as valid as you're going to get it. And there are top people all over the world now that believe it. And it's going to filter down until people can get that information to do something with it. Don't reject it. Look at it. And uh, I w I'm not going to tell you to become an anti-nuclear activist. It's not very popular these days. But I'm going to tell you that if you have an understanding of the damaging effect of nuclear energy on the at Earth's atmosphere, after a while you'll, you'll 
want nothing to do with it and do everything you can to stop it. Okay? And the misuse of it, I assume. Who? What's his name? About 30 capsules, <laughs> tablets, maybe more a day, but he was, ha you know, I wasn't dangerously ill, desperately ill, but I know he was treating a lot of people at the time who were very, very ill and people were coming from all over Australia to him. It's successful. Yeah. Mm. Okay, back to vitamins. <laughs> Some of the basics here. Uh, just, I want to say something about the uh, fish liver oils. I don't know if anybody's still on those, but uh, they're very high in mercury. I know it was a fad way back when, when everybody was using the cod liver oil and the fish liver oils for the A and D. Uh, so be careful with that. Salmon oil, yes. Salmon oil, all high, the high contamination of mercury. High contamination of mercury. That's why we're switching over to flax oil for those essential fatty acids, yes. I have a question about uh, linseed oil, flaxseed oil. Uh, I think I've got it in my The flax oil is a very, very temperamental product. Yeah, it's got to be kept in the fridge. It's got to be kept in the fridge, but it also has to be put in a dark container. Yeah. It's got to be black or something that will not attract the light, and it, it reacts very quickly with oxygen. Mm -hmm. So the processing of the flax oil is very um, temperamental, and you have to have all these conditions right or you'll be you'll start to get a rancid oil which is the then you'll get the exact opposite of what you want to do in the body so i would say the two liters uh such a high volume of oil by time you're getting to the end of it may be going already yeah well some friends have suggested that we you know uh use a bit of the time and, and freeze it and whack the rest in the freezer. Uh, they say it's cold pressed The thing. The three things that will destroy the oil are the, the light, the oxygen, and the heat. In that order, the heat is the least of your problems. Although it is a it's a it is a big problem, but it's actually the least of the three problems. Light is the worst, then oxygen, and then heat. And the light is a thousand times worse than oxygen. 
So light is by far the thing that you have to worry about the most as far as destroying the flax oil. And it's not enough to like, you know, open your bottle, pour some out and then, and then you know, cap it up again. Once it's been exposed to any light, it then becomes a continual breakdown. I mean, if, if you take it from darkness to light and then take it back to darkness, it's too late. I mean, it's, once it's been in the light at all, you've started a chain reaction that will, go, that will continue for something like 30,000 cycles. So if you, well, it, you know, the, the fl flax oil, I mean, you, look at your flax oil the same way you look at your lettuce. You know, you're not going to buy a year's supply of lettuce at a time or, or, or even a, a three-week supply of lettuce. Do you know what I mean? You just, you look at it as a perishable item and you try to buy it in, in very small, in relatively small quantities. I think if you can get a, a flax oil where we, you can open it up, like I buy the case at a time in the States where it's never been exposed to any light or oxygen until I actually open it and I keep it frozen and I just take one bottle at a time out of the freezer and use that in the refrigerator and it's a small enough bottle that between myself and my family we go through it in a couple of weeks and that's fine but I wouldn't I wouldn't have a, a big enough bottle that you're gonna it's gonna take you like a month or two to go through because you're by the time you get to the end of the bottle as Anita said no matter how well it was prepared initially it will have gone rancid in your home once you've opened it up, though. The, here's what I would prefer happening if you have the desire to do so. If you were to take certified organically grown linseed and take and germinate that by soaking it roughly for 24 hours, three tablespoons full of your linseed will be equivalent to two tablespoons full of flax oil. Okay? Three tablespoons of linseed will be equivalent to about two tablespoons of flax oil because the flax oil is about roughly 67% essential fatty acids. Now, if you take and germinate that and then blend that up and use that for a salad dressing right on the spot or use it in a, in a smoothie, uh, put it with your avocado and with your, uh, make a good, um, um, drink in the morning for your uh, uh, green papaya drink. It helps to flavor it. It helps it to go down easier. Pardon me? Sure, it has to be soaked. You want to destroy the enzyme inhibitors, okay, which are in your dried linseed. Okay, you all understand that the linseed, when properly squeezed out, the end result is your flax oil. Your flax oil does come from your linseed, but your dried linseed also has your enzyme inhibitors in it. So you want to sprout it first so that you're, you have a live, viable food. And this way you can have a very cheap supply of your, of your linseed, uh, provided it's organically grown, and very cheap supply, and uh, it's, uh, it's a healthy supply. You're as, as natural as you can get it is in a sprouted form. Yes? I have sprout it, and that, that will help you with the enzyme inhibitors. It'll make it much easier to digest. That's right. No problem. Sure, no problem. When that's what you want, that shows it's beginning to germinate properly. No problem. Yes. I'd take, two, take about two tablespoons three times a day, and that helps to emulsify the cholesterol and fatty substances in the system and bring that right down so people who have a lot of angina, heart problems like that, within a week or two they're free of it. And they feel wonderful because they, their, their arteries that were blocked are now getting cleaned out. 
and you're doing it naturally. You're not giving them a drug. You're giving them something the body really requires and is deficient of. Put it all together. And pumpkin seeds, because that's got the E in them, and it's rather fresh organic No problem. Yeah. No problem. Yes, sir. David. On the question of measurement, I understand that when you say tablespoon, that translates <laughs> from American oh, yeah. to Australian being dessert spoon. So John's tablespoon, I can't just figure that out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, oh. So it's only a type of dessert spoon in Australia. <laughs> when we say tablespoon, we mean uh, your dessert spoon. That's equivalent to our tablespoon. So every time we've used the word tablespoon, just put dessert spoon there. <laughs> Semantics. Joe. Absolutely. But you have to be careful there. If you create too much strain on the body through exercise, you know, a lot of people say you got to go out and exercise heavily. Uh, be very careful on that. Build up gradually. Even working on a, um, a problem with the little emphasizer that you're familiar with, if you overdo on that, you can cause a very toxic reaction to the body. And so you start out with maybe 30 seconds, three times a day, and no more to start out with that to get the oxygen and the nutrients moving through the system. So there's a lot of things we have to be very careful. A lot of people think a little bit will get, do you a lot of good, so a whole lot will do you a lot more. And it's just, uh, we got to be very careful on that. But what you're saying is, is d definitely true. And here's where your um, oxygen supplementation can come in very handy to help with that peripheral uh, <coughs> peripheral problem. The point holding does also, because that opens up the circulation nerve supply down through the body like nothing I have found. And that's where the body electronics is such an important aspect. Yes? Fresh rice bran that has not been um, where it hasn't gone off, okay? Now, in Canada, for example, a uh, lot of things were mentioned here about different oils, including vitamin E, uh, um, wheat germ oil, and so on. In, by law in Canada, you have to use, use your wheat bran syrup oil within three days of milling or else it is proven that it has gone rancid, even if it's stored in other means, even if it's encapsulated and so on. Uh, so we have to look at very careful on the rancidity of, of so-called fresh oils. There's no way that you can store it. And even freezing destroys certain features of a food, uh, vitamin E and so on. Freezing will have a destruction on the food, which will cause what they call a buildup of white blood cells called leukocytosis in the body, showing that the body is try is is has been given a fever, so to speak, or a foreign element in the body the body's trying to get rid of. And the only thing which will not give a, leuco, uh, a leukocytosis to the body is raw food. Any frozen food, any cooked food, any canned food will, but raw food will not. So this is a leukocytosis, an increase of white blood cell count in the bloodstream, which is an indication of a toxic reaction to what you're ingesting. Yes? Oxygen 
I've seen no problem there, frankly. I've seen. I've seen no problem there if it's done uh, properly. Now you might say, is oxygen a scavenger, or does it cause your uh, your um, what do they call it? Pre-radicals. The uh, pre-radicals. Pre-radicals. I think the answer is yes in both cases. The, the reason that the flax oil and the other really high quality oils go rancid so rapidly is because they attract oxygen so readily. I mean, that's the very reason that they will spoil much more rapidly than, say, olive oil or something like that. And if you're looking at oxygenating the body, the thing to realize is, I mean, just look at it this way. We breathe out enough, we breathe out enough oxygen that mouth-to-mouth -mouth works, right? I mean, think about that. I mean, you can keep somebody alive just with your exhalations. So the thing is, if you're looking at oxygenating the body, it's not just a question of pumping a bunch of oxygen in, you know, either by breathing deeply or ozone or, or what have you. It's also a question of improving your body's ability to utilize the oxygen that you're putting in, whether it's through breathing or whatever other means. And if you're looking at various nutritional deficiencies that are involved in that, one of the prime ones is going to be your essential fatty acids. If you're deficient in your, in your essential fatty acids, you can put all the oxygen in the world in there and it's not going to do you much good because your body, your body uh, basically every single stage of oxygen uptake and utilization you know, involves the essential fatty acids. I mean, from the lungs all the way out to the cells, and in terms of what you were saying, you know, getting the oxygen out to the cells, the essential fatty acids are one, are one factor that you need in that. So as far as doing them together, I'd highly recommend it. You know, you need, the, you need these, the, the flax oil if you're going to get the most out of your oxygen therapies. Uh, yes. Yes, John. You have a certain acid uh, called um, phytic acid in most of your seeds that causes the seeds themselves to not sprout. And that has to be eliminated from the seed, allowing the enzymes to start functioning and the germination process <coughs> beginning. Okay? Now that's where the soaking helps to eliminate that particular what we call the enzyme inhibitor. And then everything that is in that seed is then fully converted over to an enzyme uh, that the body can utilize. But as long as that other acid is there, it inhibits the, act, the actual development of the enzymes. You got it, yeah, uh, it actually goes through a change. Um, let me put it to you this way. If you take a seed and add water to it and put that in a porcelain dish, and check out the the amount of um, the amount of elements in that seed initially, and compare it with it after it has sprouted. You have total total different readings of percentages of the elements, and you have new elements forming through the activity of what we call the. Um, um, biological transmutation is taught by Dr. Louis Curvran. There's a change that goes on. New elements, new vitamins, new things that you have in a sprouted seed that you don't have in a, in a non-sprouted seed. So the sprouted seed has much more, and you might say, where did it all come from? Well, that's the process of, uh, more, uh, pardon? The biological transmutation within the element itself. Yes. Okay. Okay, yes. Not I would think it'd be all right. Well, you have to do something. I mean, uh, <laughs> right? Probably better to put in the refrigerator. Some people do not like putting things in the refrigerator because of the electromagnetic field and things like that. We're getting into different things there, but I think in that situation, if the thing is 
wilting, you have to do something. Yeah. Now, uh, in regard to, you want to say something? Else? What do you, you have a bit more to cover here, right? Yeah. Okay. Why don't we leave it for a while? Okay. They have they have some drinks prepared okay. and everything. Would you like to take a break? Okay, normally we go about four or five, six hours at a stretch. And it, uh, um, you know, but if you, let's take a little break here. You're not, you're not used to our heavy programming yet. Okay, um, regarding vitamin B, it's necessary to have a good vitamin B supplement. Now, John has um, produced a vitamin B supplement, which we get from VitaFit in New Zealand. We have a very good vitamin B complex, which John has produced from maybe it's just the angle can everyone hear me yes, yes? okay uh, also what happened uh, just at the uh, Genizano Center John had taken a poll of all the people that were not getting burning in the room during our point holdings we try to get burning through the body and that shows us the regeneration happening and uh, several people were not taking vitamin B. And when they got onto the vitamin B, immediately in the next point holding session, they got the burning. So the vitamin B is very important. Uh, it is water soluble also, so it does not store in the body. We do have to replace it every day. All, vitamin B also helps with people out there that have those mood swings. And uh, people that go into uh, crying fits and uh, anger and uh, ups and downs and uh, uh, us up here included. <laughs> President and company accepted. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in case you know anybody like this, give them a couple of vitamin B and it'll calm them right down. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was taking one a day, and uh, I was still having a little bit of mood swings, and I found that, that I increased it to two, sometimes three a day, and I just evened right out. There's still some days when I go off the handle, though. <laughs> There is a, one of the elements in the B-complex formula that I had put in was a chromium uh, material, which helps with any hypoglycemic problem. And so people who have hypoglycemia should also not only be on a B-complex, but they should also have certain trace elements, one of which will be your chromium. We have a chromium picolineate, which is a very, very necessary item to help to ease off any hypoglycemia problem. Okay, uh, now I want to move on to our oral chelation program that we use. We were very successful with this in uh, Motueka. We had a little clinic in New Zealand, in Motueka. And uh, for that, first of all, we take people off of all fried foods. Whenever you heat an oil, butter, or a molecule, uh, margarine to a high temperature, the molecule switches and the body cannot assimilate it, and it starts lining the blood vessel walls. So we take people off of all fried foods. We put them on flax oil, lipase, niacin, lecithin, and high fiber diet. And also we take them off of homogenized milk. Homogenized milk is processed to such an extent that the molecules become so small that they actually invade the cell walls, uh, causing a buildup. And there's also 
a substance called exanthine oxidase, which actually irritates the lining of the arterial walls in the homogenized milk. So uh, we're recommending uh, goat milk. Unheated, unpasteurized. Oxidase. Your cow's milk still has your xanthine oxidase in it, where your goat's milk is far better for you than your cow's milk. The curd, shall we say, the molecular structure of the particle in your milk, of your goat's milk, is, is very similar to mother's milk, where the cow's molecular structure is about seven times the size. Now, um, your cow's milk also is very high in calcium, where the, cow, the goat's milk is very high in potassium. And so if you're going to drink milk, make it goat's milk. Proverbs 27, 27 says, thou shalt have goat's milk. <laughs> okay. Also, if you're going on vacation to... Uh an island and they have coconut trees and you can't take your flax oil. The coconuts have 1% of essential fatty acids in it. Uh, we tell people to eat the new coconut, the one that's really jelly-like in the center. That has the uh, essential fatty acids, only 1%. And the, they get well. Yeah, and they do get well. People get well on this. We use this a lot in the Cook Islands with the people who couldn't afford buying the flax oil. They use the coconuts. Um, okay. Now, we're going to move on to amino acids. There are eight basic amino acids which are needed to manufacture the total 20 amino acids. Um, if we cook something, we destroy two amino acids, uh, two uh, basic amino acids, tryptophan and lysine. So if you're cooking your protein, cooking your fish, cooking your chicken, um, we are destroying those two basic amino acids. So we need to get the full eight basic amino acids. We use, for this, we use the spirulina, a low temperature process. This is very, very important because if they're using a high temperature process, you're gonna have the same problem. So a uh, low temperature process, spirulina, we found life stream in New Zealand to be good. I don't know if they have that here. Yes? Okay. Life stream. Uh, also, another good source of amino acids is bee pollen. Bee pollen. And for people who are still eating fish, raw fish. We recommend the smaller fish, not the big deep sea fish, because the big deep sea fish are full of mercury. Uh, like parasites, things like that? Yes. Uh, raw fish, you have to be careful what source you're getting it from. Yes, you could get parasites from raw fish. Yes. We tend to stick with spirulina and bee pollen ourselves. You will find that many of your health uh, stores will sell you bee pollen, which has been processed in a rotary kiln at about 160 degrees Fahrenheit to destroy all enzymes so it has a long shelf life. This also destroys part of your protein. You will also find that the spirulina, the life stream, is also processed at 160 degrees Fahrenheit, which they claim is done in such a quick process that it doesn't destroy the amino acids. I question that, but we have no data to support it one way or the other. We have found that some people have fed their children spirulina, uh, these are friends of ours, under the guise that it gives them all the protein they need, and the children did not grow until they got them on other types of animal protein, uh, which was fish, and then all of a sudden they began to sprout and grow and get healthy and well. 
but as long as they were on spirulina as a source of their protein, it wasn't enough. And here's where you may have to look very carefully at several different sources of protein and make sure it's not heated or destroyed at 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which will, will destroy your tryptophan and your lysine. Now remember, if you do not have all eight essential amino acids, you will not be able to produce the 20 necessary amino acids that you have to have for hormone secretion and manufacturing. Now, if the hormones are not present in the physical body during a, shall we say, a healing crisis, you will not have your endothermic and your exothermic reaction. Now, the exothermic reaction, of course, is the, the burning of the kundalini fire, where you have a burning in the area which brings about the regeneration in that particular uh, tissue situation. So you have to watch your protein and have a good source of protein and not compromise on that. Okay. Uh, moving on, yes. Can uh, you suggest another good type of protein other than fish or spirulina or peepon? How's tofu? Tofu we find is hard to digest, but if you're taking enzymes, should be fine. Yes. Yes. Avocado is very good, but it does not have all uh, 20, all, all the eight basic amino acids. It does have a lot of uh, protein in it, though. On, on the subject of, of protein, I uh, had been uh, vegetarian for about 10 or 12 years where I hadn't had any other than occasional cheese, you know, occasional dairy products, but not really ever on a regular basis. I hadn't had any animal products since, you know, again, since before I was on the, on the program. No, uh, no fish, no meat, no poultry, no eggs, none of that kind of stuff. And I had certainly experienced a considerable amount of healing over the years. Uh, and so when I came just down to the Genizano Center last month, it was, you know, in that context where I hadn't had you know, a lot of those foods in a, or any of those foods in a real long time. And, you know, John got talking about protein deficiency and all the rest, and I'm looking there at my own fingernails at the time, and I'm realizing that I'm uh, becoming somewhat protein deficient from my, you know, rigid adherence to a, you know, a, to a vegetarian diet over the years. And the, what basically what you'll see is you'll see the ridges in the nail, the ridges in your nails running, running lengthwise. Now, a lot of you will look at your nails there, and I think you'll find many of you will have these, these ridges, you know, running the, running the length of the, of the nail there, particularly those of you that have been vegetarian for any, cons for any length of time, you know, say three, four years or more. So I got to thinking about this, and I decided, well, you know, what's more important here, you know, rigid adherence to a particular belief or, you know, my own health. So I started eating eggs again there at the Genizano Center. Hold on. Please. I want everybody's undivided attention here. This is exceedingly important to consider for your health because I look around here and I see a lot of emaciated vegetarians. Okay? A lot of people are vegetarians, but they don't eat enough protein to keep their body healthy and well and the energy level high. So at any rate, I started eating, eating some eggs there at the Genizano Center and within about three to four days of being on of eating eggs, and I was I wasn't doing anything else any differently as far as you know. I mean, I've been taking minerals and enzymes and all the rest for, for ten years, so it wasn't anything else that I was initi initiating. Within about within about uh, three to four days of getting on the eggs, I went into a tremendous healing crisis on the lungs, where I was some of you may remember this, where I was just like constantly coughing and you know just like went from a dry cough to a wet cough, where I was getting up all sorts of stuff. I ended up spending an entire weekend. Uh, in Trinity Beach, lying on my back, watching the ceiling fan spinning around, and just tremendous, tremendous no, ceiling that was you spinning around. It wasn't that the was ceiling. A, fan. The ceiling fan wasn't. Are you, are you are you telling me the ceiling fan wasn't on? No. Oh. <laughs> At any rate, it was an interesting weekend. Somebody asked me what, when we got back to the center how my weekend was, and I said they had nice ceiling fans down there. <laughs> but. <laughs> At any rate, it put me into a huge healing crisis. You know, just getting on. You know, just getting on to the just getting on to the eggs. You forgot the burning. And one of the things that I, that I experienced at the time, and this was also, that was the eggs, and then in conjunction with doing a lot of the green pawpaw, I actually had, uh, at this time, I actually had uh, a complete dumping of the cecum without a colonic. 
which for those of you that are, are cold, you know, when you dump the cecum, how it's, you know, hot, burning, and stinging when it comes out. And, you know, I've done that lots of times with colonics. I never even heard anybody doing it without a colonic. And, I, and yet I had this, you know, such a severe healing crisis as a result of the eggs and then the green pawpaw that I actually completely dumped my cecum without the aid of a colonic. And then last, uh, last week, actually, I, got, I started eating some fish, which, you know, and I'd sworn I was never going to eat any flesh again. I hadn't eaten any in like, you know, 10 or 11 years or whatever. But I thought, you know, I'm, here I am, I'm protein deficient. Let's, let's give this a go and, you know, not worry about, you know, stupid things like being able to tell people I haven't eaten fish in a long time. You know, how important is that? So I went and ate some fish. And uh, this also was taken, started to take a lot of the min plus at the same time. Again, went into an absolutely huge healing crisis where I had like uh, just un, un, unbearable pain in my back for like three solid days. Finally did the same thing, dumped the cecum again, no pain in the back, the, the body, you know, just clean as a whistle and, you know, through the healing crisis. So I, I would encourage some of you who have been like me, you know, very rigid in our beliefs about, you know, nutrition and all to consider that sometimes uh, we're maybe, we're put it, let me put it this way. I still believe that a, that a raw foods vegetarian diet is the way to go, but I think that it's probably going to take some of us a heck of a lot longer to get there than we think. In other words, the transition may be more like 20 years as opposed to three weeks or two months or whatever. It may be that it's going to take our bodies a lot longer to get to that place. And I can only speak for myself here, but I can definitely tell you now that, I'm, that I have not been ready for it. You know, even though I've been doing it for 10 years, it's obvious from the results I've gotten in the last month that my body was not completely ready to, to give up all the animal products. So I hope some of you will learn from my ignorance here. And check out your nails. Yes. Didn't stop the healing crisis. Didn't stop the healing crisis one day. Yes. Monique. Um, are you actually recommending to sort of um, eat a bit of fish and things like that or stay with, you know, the and, and the big problems? Let's look at things from a reasonable point of view. If you're going to come from, like myself, I thought, used to think I was a health food nut when I had my organically grown ribeye steaks for breakfast, <laughs> for lunch, and T-bone steaks, bloody rare, for dinner. And I enjoyed that. And I thought I was a health food nut because I, all of my food was organically grown. Now, this was years ago. Now, you take that type of an individual heavy meat eaters because I was born and raised with, with a heavy meat eating diet. You have to eat something that sticks to your ribs. This was the uh, mid Midwest of the USA, you know. Everybody had their, had their steak three times a day and that's the way it was. And, and you weren't a man unless you had your red meat. Okay? I want you to know that I was one of the sickest people that you'll ever meet growing up. I had everything wrong with me from soup to nuts. And uh, I oftentimes, when I was growing up, I had my bacon and eggs for breakfast, my ham sandwiches for lunch, my pork chops for dinner. We lived on pork. And um, so when I switched to red meat, that organically grown, I thought I made a tremendous switch. So that was just something to consider. Now, if you take a, free, if you take a, um, a glass out of a freezer and you plunge that into hot, hot water, what happens? You break it. The human body is the same way. You cannot move from one extreme to another overnight. Sometimes under supervision on tremendously sick people, you have to to save their life. But even then, you have to be very, very wise. And so gradually, I have moved away from red meat, which I haven't had any for years, into chicken. I haven't had any of that for years. But when I was in Sri Lanka a year ago, about a year ago, January, I was down in bed for two solid weeks. I was coughing up my toenails. I had big black bags under my eyes. My tongue looked just about as bad. Uh, I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't eat. And I was really, really sick. And Anita thought I was going to die. Now, so did 
my professor there at the university. And he told me, he said, John, I'm going to send you down here to this man here. He's the best in town, best in Colombo, Sri Lanka. I'm going to have him give you a complete checkup. Now, can you imagine having to wheel me around to the x-rays in a wheelchair? Because I couldn't walk. I was just uh, so far down, they had, they had to take care of me uh, as an invalid. And I couldn't do much of anything. They checked me out and gave me blood tests from one end to the other. They couldn't find one single thing wrong with me. From all of their medical appraisal of me, and they gave me the full works, I was uh, disgustingly healthy as I was busy coughing up my toenails, as I was busy coughing up blood, as I was busy being so sick I couldn't stand up, as I was so dizzy I couldn't think. And I go back there and I'll look at the little fan on the ceiling and I see little faces inside that little circle in the center of the fan. And I think hallucinating with a high fever, but they couldn't find a thing wrong with me. Anita would check me out with uh, all of our techniques that we use in healing crisis. Healing crisis. Healing crisis. I didn't believe it. She didn't believe it. Nobody else believed it because I looked like death warmed over. At that time, I hit a low. And I broke down on my vegetarian diet and I went up and had some fish. My dry, hacking cough went into a wet cough. And so this is what we have to do when we hit that point. It, it increased the healing crisis because of the protein that my body was deficient in. Because you can't live off of coconuts and pawpaw, which we were doing and thinking we're being healthy, you know. We didn't have any protein. And the protein there, you didn't want to eat, frankly. I mean, you go up there and, and see the fish market, and there's more flies than there were fish. Have you ever been in India or Sri Lanka or anywhere? There's thousands of fish out here that are ready for eating, and for every one fish, there's a thousand flies that are trying to get inside of it. And it, uh, it, uh, it's a place you, you'd be very surprised at how the people survive. But that's the way it was. And so we did have our fish. <laughs> But it was a fresh fish, and uh, we found out how it was caught and prepared. It came right directly to our hotel. And so suddenly, I got better and gradually came out of the healing crisis. But it was because my body needed protein to push me through that final regeneration of my lungs, at which time I had two closed lesions open up and disappear entirely out of my eye. I'm very happy about that. That was, uh, that was my little gift at the end of the whole procedure. But that was after a, a healing crisis broke where I was running a very, very high fever. I was very happy about that. And then all of a sudden we were well. We picked up our baggage. We went to Madras on to, uh, uh, up to Pitaparty and visited Sai Baba's ashram. Then went over, on over to, uh, to visit some friends over in Bombay. And then we, our, the height of our entire trip was up, in, uh, uh, was up at... In, um, Varanasi, and then finally to New Delhi and back home. But that was an interesting thing because all of our strength was back as soon as we went to fish. And that's where the protein, I feel, in some cases, is an absolute nece necessity. And since that time, we have been very realistic on the matter, and we usually are quite strict on vegetarian, but I'll have my four eggs every single morning, poached. I'll have my four eggs. And then I have my energy throughout the day, and I feel good. Just want you to understand this. Now, I want to tell some of you for just a moment here while it's on my mind. One of the main issues, and you find that in my little blue book. I hope you all got a hold of this one. This is a, a basic book that you should have to give the information to your people that you're working with. Just a basic information that you need. Now, in that, it talks about what we call mature green pawpaw. One of the features of your mature green pawpaw, which has the papain in it, and this only works for papain, no other proteolytic enzyme that we are aware of. It will convert a part of the protein mass into arginine, which is one of your, nece one of your very necessary amino acids. Arginine along with exercise, will trigger the pituitary gland to secrete the human growth hormone. This human growth hormone, when secreted, then 
tends to build up the muscle structure in the human body and to eliminate fat. Now, the fat is just trimmed from the body and then you build muscles up with exercise. And when, when I was experimenting with re restructuring a couple of muscles that had been totally damaged during a car wreck, I went down to the gym and be, with Anita. We both went down together and started working out. But I had muscles that I couldn't use because they had all been atrophied and they were gone. And then using specific weights, we built the muscles back up again gradually from nothing. But we had to go through the burning of those muscles to reconstruct them. And during that time, we had to have tremendous amounts of protein in the form of eggs. We didn't eat fish at that time at all, but we ate a lot of eggs, a lot of bee pollen, a lot of spirulina, and things like this, lots of sprouts. And that built up the body to where I went from 250 pounds of, of somewhat of a questionable physical strength into th pretty close to 300 pounds. That's about a uh, little over 125K. And uh, 125K went up in there somewhere. And I, at that time, my physical body became the best it's ever been. And I played at that time full games of basketball and a full, full floor and whatnot. And I was fast and I was strong and I could do things that I haven't been able to do for years. Now this is when you build up your body. But here's where the pap pain is such an important thing for not only building the immune system, but to keep the body firm and active so it doesn't start degenerating away. And you know how a lot of older people, they start degenerating and the muscle mass kind of goes into a flab? All right? Your pap pain will stop you from doing that. And with some discipline exercise on top of that, you'll build that body right back up to where it is the same as it was in the prime of life. And you'll be strong. And Doug was there at the time we went down and worked out together. And it, uh, but it's, it's an interesting thing because you're able to build up the mass of the muscle, which in weight lifting or in bodybuilding of any kind, you're not supposed to be able to do that when you hit a certain age. But uh, the thing is, I put on another about 25, uh, put, pardon me, about 50 pounds of solid mass, which I was told ca can't be done for somebody in their 60s. You can't do that. But that was, uh, it's over and done with. And uh, when we get back to Rarotonga, we're going right back down there and do the same thing again. But here's where the protein is necessary to build up that body. You have to have the protein. And this is where the arginine is triggering the human growth hormone. This helps that body to rebuild wonderfully. Now, some of you have asked me, what do you do for the fat on your body? Where's, uh, where's the daughter? This was for her, one of her questions. For Mandy. And, it, and if you take that mature green papaya and get that papain in your system and exercise a little bit every day, you'll find that the fat will drop right off and you'll have strong, healthy muscles, tissue under that and that and the things will start coming right. And the body will rebuild. How about the dried papain? Uh, the dried papain, the pharmaceutical... Uh, uh, most of your, where they've extracted the papain and dried it and so on and processed it, it's not good. It doesn't have the same activity as you get it right from the ripe papaya. Now, you grow your papayas and treat those as one of the most important uh, uh, crops that you have. You don't have the uh, Pardon me? You don't have the tree? Get a pawpaw tree. It takes nine months and you're, you're, you're full, of, uh, full of pawpaws. I'm from um, If you dry it at a low temperature, yes. It'll help out. But you have to thoroughly... Um, shall we say, get it dehydrated, so to speak, or else the, ox the moisture will activate it and then it's all destroyed and begins to deteriorate. Yes? Yes. Yeah, the seeds are good. And they're full of papain. And it's also one of the healthiest things you can have. But remember about pregnancy. Uh, I just had a question, actually. With the... Um, I'm looking at the, considering the, the idea of dehydrating the green pawpaw, and it seems like it would be quite a, a tremendous amount of work to really get it well dehydrated. 
what about because you know at home we often you know get bananas and things and freeze them and then end up using them in smoothies. W would you still have the enzyme activity if you froze the green pawpaw and then later you know thawed it out and used it in smoothies? The enzyme activity would still be there, but under using your chromatography, right? As soon as you freeze it, you've lost something. You've lost some life force there that then becomes destructive to the body, which is indicative by the leukocytosis or the increase in white blood cell by eating any type of frozen food. Um, am I going to tell you not to eat frozen food? No, I'm not going to tell you that. Because sometimes you're going to have to have something there uh, to feed the relatives when they come to the home. Okay? I mean, let's look at it realistically. Thank you.